We actually think that rates at the current levels are too restrictive given the slowdown in activity that we have seen this year. We're not expecting a collapse. But there is no doubt the consumer's slowing. Not much has changed with the consumer over the last six months. They're employed, wages are growing, but they are being choiceful. The direction of travel is towards a weaker economy. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Growth looks good now, but we do see slowing going forwards. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg surveillance starts right now. Coming into Thursday, waiting for the appetizer to Friday. Your scores look like this. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Just about unchanged on a two-day losing streak. On the Nasdaq 100, down by 0.2%. On a Russell, the small caps a little softer. Also down by 0.2%. Your day ahead, a sneak peek, it looks like this. 8.15 Eastern Time, the ADP report. 8.30, initial jobless claims. Then 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Lisa and ISM services print. These numbers are going to be actually especially important, not only because of the jitters that we've seen in markets, but yesterday's jolts data, which for the same month that we got the jobs, mark, uh, jobs report in August, uh, the July numbers that really showed weakness. Do we see current data that confirms that, this feeling that maybe there is this sort of protracted weakness that's going to require a bigger response from the Fed and potentially could be something different than what the market's price? Don't you think the echoes of early August are growing? Just to compare and contrast, ISM manufacturing, back end of July into early August, people start to get nervous. Jobless claims, people start to get nervous. The jobs data going into the big one, payrolls, and then we get that payrolls report. How close are we to repeating what we already saw a month ago? This is what a lot of people are talking about, including Mike Wilson, the sense that bad news is bad news, and we're seeing that bad news percolate from a number of corners, but weakness does not mean weak. And there were a number of positive data points, like the quits rate that went down yesterday. It's not as though the sky is falling, and anecdotally from companies, yes, you are seeing cooling, but it's not as if there's a mass group of layoffs that are being planned. You even heard that in the Beige Book, which I actually thought was quite interesting. But looking forward, here's the issue. Are we set up just a touch differently given the outperformance of the equal weight, given the sort of cyclical rally that we've seen so far? You can feel the anxiety, though, over the last few days, selling stocks, buying bonds. Your two-year yield at the moment, 376. Your 10 year 377. We can talk about the shape of the curve in just a moment. I want to talk about payrolls tomorrow as well. Just to go through some of the estimates for you. 165, still the median estimate in our survey for headline payrolls. Beneath the surface, the focus elsewhere, I guess, is going to be on unemployment. Looking for that unemployment rate to come back from 4.3. And Marie to 4.2%. And maybe for many people, that's going to be the data point they put more weight on. Right, because now you have everyone asking Fed officials if you are seeing weakness, like Mary Daly, in the labor market, is it enough to potentially go 50? And she said she was unsure just yet. Not just unemployment. Drew Mattis yesterday, Jonathan, told us also hours worked. Because if more people are working less hours, potentially that means it's finding harder to find full-time, more hours worked. And likely that means layoffs could be on the way. What's the North Star for this conversation? It's one quote from Chairman Powell of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We don't seek or welcome further calling in the labor market. Was yesterday evidence of further calling in the labor market? Some people said yes simply because you also saw the ratio of job openings to the unemployed falling to below levels in 2019. There are a number of data points that are coming out that edify what Jay Powell had to say about the market being looser than what we saw pre-pandemic, which is a concern for them given what some of the trends have been. That said, and I go back to the beige book. I go back to my conversations yesterday with CEOs. None of them are talking about things falling off a cliff. They're talking about expansion. They're talking about growth. They're talking about consumers that have not yet dropped off the map. To me, this sort of represents the confusion of this moment. And the anxiety that you're feeling in markets is it never happens linearly. You never see it like this, and then that's it. But there is a feeling that maybe, you know, this time is different. For every CEO that you've found, I can find you another one that says something totally different. And that's the problem, right? A dollar tree, a dollar general. The struggle's there. Painful, painful stuff for those two companies in the past week or so. And that actually raises even more concern because those cater to some of the lower income uh, families. But if you take a look at the beige book, okay, let's just sit on this. I keep well, it's the third time you've mentioned okay, this, so yeah, go for okay, it. Look, I just, I think that, <laughs> I think that people <laughs> underestimate the difference in the commentary from Boston, from New York, from St. Louis, from Atlanta. Some saying things are fine. You saw that in Richmond. Uh, meanwhile, you're seeing in St. Louis reducing profit margins. Chicago, further weakening of demand could result in future layoffs. In New York, 
Hiring has shifted primarily for replacement. And these are actual tangible feelings of difference between the regions. But in general, 9 of 12 cooling. To me, that's actually significant. Employers were more selective with their hires. That's what stood out to me. They're hiring, but they are choiceful and they are selective. Not falling off a cliff, but it is slowing down. What do we think of this word choiceful? How many times have we heard this word choiceful? How many times did you hear that word at the Goldman Sachs retail conference? You want to know my honest opinion? No one's listening. I don't like that word. Are they being choosy? Now there's Jonathan. Well, I, I'm sorry. Like, I, just choiceful, what does that mean? You're I'm putting full lipstick of on a pig. It sounds like it's got positive connotations, right? It doesn't. It no. doesn't at all. It's like you're voting. You know, you're choiceful. Like, I've got a lot of choices. I can make choices. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a capitalistic society. No. Are they choosy? Are they uh, struggling? Like, uh, give me something that actually means something. Picky. Picky. They're struggling. And no one really wants to just say that, right? If you're a CEO, isn't it better just to say the consumer's choiceful right now? <laughs> yes, it's another way of saying, you know, they've got discretion and it's more competitive to get their dollar. I just am trying to figure out how much they're actually having to reduce prices and, and shrink margins versus not. I don't know how much is, is, is marketing to. If things are really falling off a cliff, they would have come out with a much more negative picture. Otherwise, they would have had a trouble explaining away their disappointment. It's great to have you back. You were missed. Thank you. I've missed the rent. That's for sure. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about unchanged. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. In the bond market, plenty of price action for you. 376.65 on a US 10-year. The two-year basically in line. The two-year 10-year curve turning positive on weaker jobs data yesterday. Lisa, for only the second time since 2022, but still struggling to close at that level. Yeah, and it closed uh, at that flat level for the first time, as you said, in more than two years. Question to me is, is this a good sign or a bad sign? We've typically seen this be a, a, a sign of actually recession, that when you have an inverted yield curve and then it does disinvert, that typically is when the recession starts. At this point, though, you're seeing it at the front end. Basically, the Fed is expected to come in and cut rates really aggressively in order to save off the economy. And you're not seeing runaway activity on the long end. I don't know. I don't know what to make of this. I do know that this actually helps the financials, and that's what people are looking at. Usually that's a sign of bad things happening in the U.S. economy, and we can get some views on that for you throughout this morning. This hour, we'll catch up with John Stolfus of Oppenheimer, with stocks coming off two days of losses. Isaac Boltanski of BTIG, as President Biden prepares to block the Nippon U.S. steel deal, and Kathy Boschancic of Nationwide on why she still sees a resilient labor market. We begin with our top story. Stocks looking to snap a two-day losing streak as traders await jobless claims data at 8.30 Eastern and payrolls numbers tomorrow morning. John Stolfus of Oppenheimer looking to the data for a preview of the Fed's next decision, writing, we are looking for a 25 basis point rate cut to be announced on September 18th, potentially to be followed by cuts of 25 basis points in November and December if needed. John is with us now for more. John, welcome to the program. Let's get straight into some of your calls in the equity market. We looked at Dollar General in the last week, Dollar Tree in the last 24 hours, highlighting the pain the consumer's going through, job openings dropping back down to levels we haven't seen for a number of years. And yet, John, you want to buy cyclical areas of the economy. What's behind that call? I think what it is, Jonathan, is where we are today is we are in the process of a normalization, moving towards sustainable growth, uh, at, at a pace where we don't grow inflation uh, too hot, and yet we do not destroy uh, the labor market. Uh, and I think that uh, it, it, you don't want to get defensive now. It's it's uh, wrong time, we would think. So we want to own cyclicals. We want to be broadly diversified to take advantage of what has been a much broader rally across the 10 sectors uh, uh, since uh, mid-year. Uh, and at this point, uh, we would say, uh, if anything, that uh, the jolts numbers, if you look at the jolts numbers and you go back, I put them on my Bloomberg and I went back from uh, July of 09 to July of 2018, which was a real period of recovery uh, moving moving through that. Then the, the average uh, jolts was 4,608 and people got bent out of shape with a 7,000 number yesterday. I don't get it. John, other people do get it, and they're buying utilities, they're buying staples, they're buying real estate. Why is that the wrong place to be? I don't think it's the wrong place to be. I think you want to own some of them. I just wouldn't be overweight uh, utilities uh, or staples. Uh, and the performance on a year-to-date basis, on a basis of from the lows of October 5th, 
Uh, and in the rally points that we see all favor uh, cyclicals uh, in, in a very definite manner. Uh, that, uh, it's where you see the earnings growth, uh, although you do see there's been awfully good earnings growth in utilities uh, within the S&P 500, but a lot of that is likely uh, the result of uh, regulators uh, allowing utilities to charge more as their input costs have gone up significantly uh, over the last few years. As you mentioned, the cyclical play has actually gotten quite a bit of attention, has actually done better and outperformed over the past couple of months. What hasn't is NVIDIA, which is down 22 percent since June 18th, since that peak that it saw then. Why not just hoover up NVIDIA at a 22 percent discount? Well, you've got to say, what, what is it? I, I think the other day I'm just hearing it, it's up over 100 percent since the start of the year, even with that uh, that pullback. Uh, you've got to figure that it, what, what we're seeing now is broader diversification uh, being selected by investors uh, after we've seen these narrow uh, periods, uh, narrow leadership uh, with the S&P 500. And as we're in a period where the, the Fed has stated it's very much concerned about uh, the labor market and doesn't want to hurt jobs in here. Uh, you're going to get a rate cut uh, uh, coming up uh, earlier than we'd expected. It looks like September is good for 25 bips. And we think there's good chances, as uh, as you mentioned at the beginning of, of this segment, uh, we, we, we were thinking 25 in November, a potential and another 25 cut uh, in, in December. It, you know, it's as needed, as it says on the prescription bottle. Uh, but the, no, no recession yet. And more people believe we were likely to skirt uh, or, or avoid recession. Uh, so we, we think you want to own cyclicals. So uh, that's exactly. We also think once the Fed begin, but once the Fed begins to cut, you'll see a more sustainable uh, uh, a rally potential from small and mid cap stocks, which have faded in and out you know, during this period. This is exactly where I wanted to go because you previously thought that rate cuts weren't necessary in this economy, and the as needed label on the bottle is being whipped out now at a time that that as needed is somewhat concerning to some people, particularly for cyclical areas that depend on a less choiceful consumer, uh, one that is less uh, sort of discretionary. How much are you concerned that it is as needed? for the Fed to potentially cut rates as much as 50 basis points this month? Uh, you know, I don't think they're going to do 50. I, I don't think it, it's quite needed. The calls for 50 really come from more highly uh, leveraged, player, uh, leveraged players than intermediate to long-term uh, investors who tend not to be as, as levered. Uh, but the other thing is when when you talk about the dollar stores without getting in particular with either one of those, you've got to remember that a lot of their constituency has been supplanted uh, by the likes of the bigger discount companies in, in the S and P 500 uh, that have offerings that are that are more competitive and more con more attractive uh, because in the, in the case of the largest uh, uh, component in the uh, consumer staples when it comes to big box kind of shopping, they just have the volume uh, to be able to get better pricing. So the fact that some of those stores that in another era would be really very popular uh, uh, on lower income, uh, you know, their, their, their offerings are probably not as attractive and perhaps their managements have not worked as well uh, as the larger companies that are, are clicks and mortar or rather, uh, yeah, mortar and clicks or clicks and mortar, what have you. Execution issues. John, thank you. Interesting last word there. John Stolfus of Oppenheimer. On the Federal Reserve, it doesn't matter what any of us think. It matters what they're going to do, which is why Mike McKee came on this program a little bit earlier this week and said that maybe the biggest event this week was at 11 a.m. on Friday. Why 11 a.m.? on Friday. The quiet period for the Federal Reserve kicks off on Saturday. And Lisa, at 11 a.m. on Friday, there's a speech from Governor Waller. A few hours after that Labor data drops, if they want to go 50, that's the moment to signal it. Chris Waller is going to be uh, the person who comes out and says, ultimately, we don't think the economy is falling off a cliff. This is just what I project the speech to be. Should we get a negative uh, or sort of a disappointing payrolls report? <clears throat> this is what it is. Basically, it comes out and he says, we don't think the economy is falling off a cliff. We do think that it is overly restrictive, our current condition. Mm -hmm. And so we need to adjust uh, by a measure that is representative by how restrictive we are based on the conditions. And we do want to make sure that the labor market is sustained and not deteriorate more markedly. I wonder if Governor Waller was happy with that impression of him. <laughs> 
we'll, we'll I, find I like that you took a deep breath ahead of it too. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about unchanged. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Nippon Steel's proposed $14 billion takeover of U.S. Steel has all but collapsed. Sources tell Bloomberg President Joe Biden will formally announce his decision to kill the deal as soon as the Committee on Foreign Investment formally recommends its termination. Both Nippon and U.S. Steel have suggested that they could challenge that. U.S. Steel has been warning that thousands of jobs are at risk. Nippon, for its part, made extensive concessions in recent weeks, committing to invest $1.3 billion in U.S. steel mills. Mills. Tesla says it will launch its full self-driving technology in China and Europe in the first quarter of next year. That pens regulatory approval. The Tesla AI account posted its release roadmap on X, outlining out upcoming launches for each stage. That does assume, though, that Tesla is on track to gain permission from both China and Europe for the self-driving tech. Tesla sees it as a way to boost sales and stay ahead of its Chinese rivals, who are working on similar systems. Tiffany is planning to downsize a major flagship store in Shanghai. Sources tell us that the two-floor, 12,000-square-foot store will mostly be vacated later this month, but its Blue Box Cafe will remain open. It has been an increasingly challenging business environment for global luxury brands that are facing a property market slump in China and a broader economic slowdown. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes. It's tough in China for the luxury players, that's for sure. This from JP Morgan earlier on today, abandoning its buy recommendation for Chinese stocks. And the quote, here's the quote, the impact of a potential tariff war 2.0 could be more significant than the first tariff war. We expect China's long-term growth to trend down structurally due to supply chain relocation, the expansion of US-China conflicts and continued domestic issues. This is a fascinating point at a time where every retailer is looking to continue its presence or even expand in China, even while saying their biggest concern, a tariff war. We'll come back to that a little bit later this morning. Up next on the program, United over U.S. Steel. United States Steel, an iconic American company. U.S. Steel should remain American-owned and American-operated. U.S. Steel is going to be sold to Japan. I wouldn't let it happen. U.S. still stuck between a rock and a hard place. That conversation up next, live from New York this morning. Good morning. It's Jobs Day, and Bloomberg has the report under surveillance. It's from super hot to solid. This is normal. I think people underestimate the behavioral aspects when it comes to the labor market. This Friday, Jonathan, Lisa, Anne Marie, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. So, what is bad on September 6th? Nobody really has a full answer on it. I don't know what counts as good news these days. It's a big debate. The August Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg. Payrolls data just around the corner. And this morning as well, 8.15, an ADP report, 8.30, jobless claims. Equity futures into all of that. Just about positive on the S&P 500. Just about unchanged. In the bond market, yield tied by almost the basis point. The 10-year, 3.76, 46. Under surveillance this morning, United over U.S. Steel. United States Steel, an iconic American company for more than a century, is going to remain an American company. U.S. Steel should remain American-owned and American-operated. The great U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel is being sold to Japan. I don't like that. U.S. Steel is going to be sold to Japan. I wouldn't let it happen. Here's the latest. Republicans and Democrats agreeing the U.S. Steel should remain American-owned and operated. Bloomberg Learning President Biden is preparing to block Nippon Steel's $14.1 billion takeover of the firm as soon as this week. Isaac Bortansky of BTIG writing this. The only lesson the market can take from this one is to get the wheels turning on high-profile deals well before we enter the heat of the campaign season, especially if the acquisition target has the historical significance and political weight of U.S. Steel. Isaac joins the program for more. Isaac, welcome back to the program. I think we have to throw in there as well the comments from U.S. Steel to the Wall Street Journal in the last 24 hours, making the case that without this deal, there will be job losses and the headquarter will be moved out of Pittsburgh. So the question I have to ask this morning, Isaac, is how do the campaigns change? Who makes the most compelling case that ultimately they can protect jobs without a takeover? 
Yeah, look, I think I think watching that that intro, it's almost heartening to see that there's such agreement among the political parties about this deal. It's just a shame that that agreement is built on protectionist soil, right? And I think that that's something that I think the market needs to take as a takeaway from this in that had this deal been announced a year earlier or a year later, I don't think that it would have faced the same amount of, of political headwinds. And so I think when we t start thinking about foreign direct investment more broadly, I think that we're going to have to start thinking about this from a timing perspective as well to try to avoid these large elections, especially for something as iconic as U.S. Steel, um, given the significance of Pennsylvania. Isaac, if we do have the president come out and block this deal, once CFIUS gives that recommendation, hits his desk, we have to wait for that recommendation legally, what happens next? What does U.S. Steel do? Look, I think that we have to assume there's going to be a lawsuit uh, here. I think that um, first we're going to have to see what the legal reasoning is. And, and I've spent a fair amount of time on this. I, I don't see where the national security risk is. I, I don't think that there is a viable argument that there's a national security risk. Um, I also don't think that there is any semblance of an argument to be made that Japan is a risk. But we're going to have to see what the reasoning is. A lot of time is spent at the CFIUS level on these things. And, and I'm still a believer that if you give lawyers enough billable hours, they can come up with any argument. So we'll have to see what, what we get from that. But my gut tells me that this is going to litigation. And I think that the companies have a good uh, shot here, depending upon what that reasoning is. It's just time. It's time. They're going to burn more and more time. And at that point, you wonder if, if the calculus changes for the parties. Well, they're working on high-end chips together. This is one of America's staunchest allies. So if CFIUS comes out and says that there is actually a national con security concern with one of the biggest allies taking over and investing in a U.S. company, then what leg do they have to stand on in the future? Yeah, look, I, if you can't sell to Japan, who can you sell to? Right. I think that this is this is something that I struggle with as well, because there's a cognitive dissonance here where we are trying to elevate our relate and deepen our relationship with Japan in every way to counter China's rise. And yet in this one instance, because of the name of this company and because of where it is headquartered, this doesn't pass muster. Right. And I think that's something that, that all of us are struggling with, because all we want is to know the rules of the road. Who can buy? Who who can uh, push these transactions forward? And the fact here is, this rejection doesn't comply with the rules of the road as we have known. And I think that that is going to have a chilling effect on foreign direct investment. And I think that it's it's going to add some volatility in markets where otherwise we would have had some certainty on the rules of the road. Isaac, when I talk to executives, when I talk to analysts, there seems to be a belief that all of this that we're hearing being announced with its protectionist, uh, potentially antitrust issues are mostly for the election. And after that, it will go back to what makes sense for business. Do you think that that is true? Is that also something that you feel? And is that what history has shown? I think that there are going to be small windows that you can operate in. Uh, shortly after elections and before we get into the ramped up period of midterms and then presidential reality, that we're always in an election cycle. And so, uh, again, I think that this deal, had it been announced one year prior or one year later, maybe the calculus is different. Um, but, but for my clients, and what I'm trying to argue here is there isn't much that unites the parties here. And this new virulent protectionist string that you're seeing both in the Republican and Democratic Party is something that I don't see going away. And so maybe you can time things up so that you're running through the CFIUS review right at the right time, maybe six months after inauguration rather than a few months before the election. Perhaps you can time it up that well, way, but we are in a constant campaign season. And it's not going to end anytime soon. Isaac, thank you, sir. Isaac Bortansky of BTIG on US Steel. US Steel yesterday down by more than 17%. I have to say, and we'll speak to an analyst about it a little bit later, I was surprised by the scale of the move. Who thought this was going through? Yeah, well, and who's trading on some of the prognostications that we're hearing on campaign trails? Again, it just speaks to this lack of conviction and maybe even liquidity. That name is slightly positive in the pre-market, up by around 2%. Coming up on this program, a brutal EV reality check for the auto industry.
Live from New York, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about unchanged. Some stability after a very choppy two days to kick off the month of September. Unchanged on the S&P, on the Nasdaq slightly lower by 0.14%. That's the stock market, plenty of price action in the bond market, the bid. It's strong to start the month of September. The two-year down to 376.62. The 10-year down to 376.46. The yield curve very slowly normalizing after being inverted for the most part of the last two years. This after job openings came out yesterday at the lowest levels since 2021. Just to give you a sense of what's driving this, it has absolutely been the two-year dropping by a percentage point from its recent peak uh, just a couple months ago. And yesterday it closed at its clo uh, lowest closing level going back to September of 2022. This even as 10-year yields are just lower by about a half a percent, and you see them closing at the lowest level since 2023 in July. So here's the question that I have. Basically, is this a suggestion that the Fed is going to get ahead of any kind of weakness, cut rates aggressively, and keep the economy afloat? Or is this the belief uh, that essentially we don't know anything about the long term, we can bet on the short term, and the short term looks like the Fed has some room to cut, so let's go there. I mean, I don't understand how bullish versus bearish this type of move actually is. We saw a movie that had a beginning like this about a month ago. The data came out, ISM manufacturing, soft. Then we had a jobs number, it was jobless claims last time around, came out, soft. Payrolls ultimately came out and did the same thing. Then for the next several weeks, the next three weeks, we had jobless claims come out that came back down, lower, and that just put a lid on some of the concern. And I just wonder here, here we go again, ISM manufacturing, soft, this time job openings, lower since 2021. If we get a payrolls report tomorrow and a jobless claims number at 8.30 that signals things are okay, do we put a lid on all this again? Does this reverse? Or have we gone somewhere now that we're not returning from? My deep impression is we have gone somewhere we're not returning from, not in full, just simply because of we welcome no further weakening in the labor market. Those words by Jerome Powell, the time has come. This really highlights a shift in tone. We heard this from Mary Daly also. She thinks that policy is very restrictive. She supports a move and wouldn't say whether it was 25 or 50 basis points at the September 18th meeting. This indicates there has been a shift in the balance of priorities for a Federal Reserve that squarely believes that where we are is way too restrictive for the economy that we have in our hands. As you get that move at the front end of the curve, check out the move in the FX market. Three consecutive days of yen strength and dollar weakness coming off the back of the worst month for the US dollar of the year so far. Dollar yen at the moment at about 143.50. We're down by two tenths of 1%. Just as you think we've cut the link between the Japanese yen and risk assets in the United States, people start to talk about exactly that all over again. Well, the idea of how much of this trade has actually been unwound, given how many, uh, uh, how much money has gone into the dollar trade. Also a question of how far this divergence can go between the Japanese economy and the U.S. economy. Who's driving the boat? On this level, it's both because you got Japanese real wages unexpectedly rising overnight. So at the same time that you're seeing disappointing data in the U.S., you're seeing better than expected data or hotter than expected data in Japan. Point being, there's still a lot of work to be unwound fully if you do see that divergence continue to widen. Dolly Yen, 143.50. Under Savannah's this morning, some top stories for you. Vice President Kamala Harris calling for a 28% capital gains tax on people earning $1 million or more. The presidential candidate seeking to ensure the wealthy pay their fair share and drawing contrast with rival Donald Trump. Also drawing some contrast with the sitting president on this front. Absolutely. He was embracing something closer to 40%. And I spoke to individuals close to Kamala Harris yesterday and what they're talking about is they want to demonstrate that she is taking real steps to try to make sure that she's talking to the business community showing the business community that she is a safe pair of hands but at the end of the day it doesn't really matter what Trump or Kamala Harris have to say on taxes this is going to be the biggest fight in the US Congress and the composition of Congress matters so much more for the taxes of next year. It's such a polite way of saying it ain't gonna happen, so people aren't really paying attention to it. But the real diplomatic. I mean, the, the, for me, really looking at this, it's sort of, you know, Joe Biden playing mean grandpa, and then she can come in and play nice, uh, nice uh, potential presidential candidate. And how much are they gonna play off each other in this kind of way? Mean grandpa. Can you imagine if it was still running? And the Republicans ran with that. <laughs> That's why I'm not. Where did that one come from? Well, that was actually Libby, Libby Cantrell. Is that what Libby said? Or like, you know, she, no, she didn't say that. Are you blaming this on Libby now? <laughs> I'm not blaming okay, this on Libby. Okay, let's just move on. Let's go to a different story. Lisa's still digging. Let's turn to <laughs> NVIDIA. 
responding to a Bloomberg News report about the U.S. Department of Justice sending out subpoenas, saying it has been in contact with the agency, but it hasn't been officially subpoenaed. The company adding that its edge in the AI computing market stems from the superiority of its products. Now, there's some confusion over this, and Ian King here at Bloomberg, I think, has helped explain some of it in his story. So I'll just read his words verbatim. The DOJ often sends requests for information in the form of what's known as civil investigative demand, which is commonly referred to as a subpoena. The Department of Justice has sent such a request seeking information about NVIDIA's acquisition of Run AI and aspects of its chip business. This is according to one person, Anne-Marie, with direct knowledge of the matter. It sounds a little bit like semantics. What do you call something officially? At the end of the day... The direction of travel is obvious when it comes to what the DOJ is seeking from NVIDIA, NVIDIA and their concern about this company and the fact that they think it's basically um, has too much of an edge, too much of a market share, and they're concerned as well with this acquisition of Run AI. So they're digging into that, but I think the idea that they didn't get a subpoena potentially is just semantics. Well, to me, of course they're being looked at. I mean, at a certain point, they're the dominant behemoth. They're the only game in town. Of course, people are going to look and see what kind of monopoly are they getting over this. Question is, how much does this potentially curtail their future growth, curtail their future business? Share price seems to suggest that people are worried about this, but it also could be that the shares are off 22% from their record high after still rising more than 100% so far this year. So hard to know how much to read into this, given the fact that it's almost status quo to be investigated by antitrust officials, by uh, by the DOJ, just by virtue of where we are in this particular uh, policy cycle, as well as their dominance over the field. There is a correlation between success and investigations in the world attack and <laughs> always has been. I mean, right? Yeah. NVIDIA is up by 0.6% in the pre-market. The latest on the Fed, we've mentioned this a few times, the San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly telling Reuters the Fed needs to cut interest rates to keep the labour market healthy, saying that it will come down to incoming economic data to determine by how much. Her comments coming ahead of jobless claims later on this morning at 8.30 Eastern Time. Let's turn to this industry. Automakers turning to cost-cutting measures as headwinds mount in the EV industry. Volvo Car, the latest to change course, abandoning its target to sell only fully electric vehicles by the end of the decade. This coming as Volkswagen defends plans to consider factory closures in Germany for the first time in its 87-year history. On top of all of these stories, RBC's Tom Narayan. Tom, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. The reality check for some of these automakers, VW coming out and saying we maybe got two plants too many. Are we about to go on a big cost-cutting cycle in this industry? I think Companies like VW have wanted to do this for a long time, right? I mean, they, they have these corporate governance challenges they face. Very difficult when 25% uh, of your company is owned by the government of Lower Saxony and labor is half your supervisory board to cut plants. So to some extent, I think this is a political move to something they've always wanted to do. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we don't need as many cars, potentially, as what we did in the past, what they thought they would need to produce. And this EV slowdown is in full effect. VW has been pushing very aggressively towards an EV future, full electric. And in Europe, if you look at the data, it's been shifting aggressively to hybrid. Just look at the Toyota numbers to sell a ton of hybrids there. So I think part of it is let's pivot, maybe not as aggressively to BEVs, which require a dedicated plant. Uh, maybe now they could produce more ICEs and hybrids on existing facilities. You don't need as much. But so part of it is the EV slowdown. Part of it is also kind of political gamesmanship. Something they've always wanted to do is to reduce the plant footprint. Well, let's talk about the games politically now. Ultimately, they're crying out for more subsidies, aren't they? Doesn't the state have to subsidize the hell out of this in Europe? Do they have the appetite to do that? That's been the issue, right? I mean, at the end of last year, Germany cut these subsidies, and you're seeing the result of it in the EV sales kind of fall off a cliff uh, so far this year. So, yeah, in Europe, it's uh, the, the EV demand is all about subsidies, right? And they have these huge CO2 rules they have to comply with. We don't have that issue in the U.S., and, yeah, they're going to have to step in. The problem is, can these governments really support these subsidies? That's an open question. And until they do so, people are going to keep buying hybrids. This is a Lisa question. Will the market fund it? 
I see this, is this issue in, in Europe now as a major one for financial markets potentially. Ultimately, you've got these automakers saying, we've got overcapacity, we're cutting the factories. They want to hold on to the factories because they're worried about the politics and particularly the shift to the right in places like Germany. So ultimately, this is the dilemma they face. Either they allow the factories to close and people lose their jobs and the politics goes further to the right away from the incumbent, or they have to come up with the money and subsidize the hell out of this industry. Now, whether they've got the appetite to do so or the ability to do so, even if they have the willingness, is another matter altogether. Which really brings 2009 back into the fore in the U.S., when the U.S. basically rescued the entire Detroit complex. And the question of what efficiencies or inefficiencies really emerged from that. Uh, Tom, from that experience, what will this look like in five years? What kind of legacy European program will there be? Because I can't imagine they're going to let, the government will let this fail, even if it is significant subsidies that are required. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, two things could happen. Either they loosen some of these rules. For example, the ban on ICEs originally with 2030, 2035. Mental. That's probably going to be loosened, right? I but really the flip side is, you know, you guys know Europe. It's, uh, they go down a course, it's happening. And that's kind of the, what, we're, what we're learning when we talk to folks there, uh, and, you know, who understand the political sphere is this is happening. You know, Green parties, et cetera, have a lot of power there. They're going to try to go towards uh, CO2 compliance. And that means the governments will have to step in eventually. Or the hope that these automakers have is in, in maybe not today, but in five years, battery prices could come down. Unless it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? Like right now, EVs are expensive to make because there's not enough made. So there's no scale economics. But when you make a bunch of them, the price comes down. But if nobody wants them, you can't then you can't make them. <laughs> so it's this weird dynamic. You're going to need the government to step in to catalyze this, to lower the pricing. Um, I, I, I have to believe that eventually is what happens. Maybe we're just in a lull phase right now and the demand comes back in a few years. Um, but that's really what it comes down to. If I were a pessimist, I might say I was actually in several places in Europe and I was really struck by how many Chinese cars were on the road. And it was very different than what I see in the United States. I was really struck by that. At a certain point, as you get uh, sort of the discussion among officials in Germany and elsewhere and debates around how much they can subsidize, someone is knocking on their door and bringing vehicles in, and that's China. How much does that change the equation and permanently still market share in a way that's irrevocable? I think that's the bigger issue. That's the bigger threat. And it's not really a threat today. You probably, I don't know if you were in Norway, maybe you saw a bunch of them there, but actually- No, but you can take me. In Germany, <laughs> in Germany, you actually don't have a ton of, of, of Chinese EVs. Um, I think it's something that you hear a lot about in the, in the press. It's because there's tariffs now, right? Europeans have, have put on them. Um, but certainly once the Chinese start producing those cars locally, it's gonna be a threat. There's no way around it. Um, and in, in that, at that time, which is in a few years, the European automakers have to get their act together. They're going to have to lower prices, produce batteries domestically, and it's tough to do. They don't have the IRA like we do because they have to sell cars in China and they don't want to upset them, right? <laughs> so I do think that's a big threat. But I would look, if I'm an optimist, I would look back historically at Europe. You know, I was there for four years. You don't see a lot of, like, of Japanese cars. You see a lot of Fiat's in Italy. You see a lot of Volkswagens in Germany, etc. Why is that? Or Peugeots in France, they like their national champions, you know. And and I do think the European consumer, at the end of the day, will buy the car of their country. But to your point, maybe something is different here. We have to wait and see. I do think that's a bigger threat in the next few years. Ultimately, the governments will step in and try to protect because it comes to do with jobs. That's where Europeans care about more than anything else. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And already you see news that the union is saying, at least with VW, potentially will accept a four week work week in order to maintain people keeping their jobs. You mentioned the IRA so quickly. Do you what parts of the IRA stay or go if we get Trump? I think it's really difficult to undo the IRA. And remember, a lot of these battery production facilities are in purple or red states. So that means jobs. It's something that I don't think Trump wants to. Uh, do anything to, to, to destroy. Uh, but I do think that ultimately they could take away like kind of some loopholes. Like there's this lease loophole. If you lease an EV, you get the subsidy. I'm not quite sure what's the justification behind that. That could potentially go away. Um, there could be some limitations on when you can get the $7,500 credit. You know, if you produce, if you get a lot of sourcing from China or some amount, 
they could try to attack that again. But that happens from both administrations. Yeah. But ultimately, battery production domestically in the U.S. is something both administrations would, I think, support. So I think it's here to stay. Just before you go, plenty of problems. Some companies are doing okay. I can think of one in Europe, BMW, better numbers on the EV side. You mentioned Toyota, just in the right place at the right time, right strategy. Stuck with hybrids, didn't go all the way to EVs. Who's doing it right stateside? Which company do you like right now? Yeah, and I think this comes down to what you guys are talking about earlier with soft landing and rates and all that. Like, if we do get into a soft landing, this industry actually is very interesting, very attractive, because they built up so much cash during the pandemic, and now some of these guys are buying back a ton of stock. So notably GM. Uh, and if we do get into soft landing, I do like that name. Um, but outside of that, if you want it to be defensive and you're worried about autos, then I think a name like Ferrari, even though it's very expensive, potentially, um, it's a place to hide out. And then, I know this sounds really weird, in a weird way, Tesla is defensive because it's not really autos, and they could just at any day pull the lever and lower FSD pricing, something that everybody should try. Um, and I think that could be an interesting one. Nice to squeeze some Ferrari in there too, Tom. We appreciate it. Tom Naran there of RBC. Welcome back anytime. That was great, Bramo. He was pandering. He's completely pandering. I'm sorry, did he pay you off? <laughs> Not like at your all. national champion. Okay, it's beautiful. Not at all. Okay, you own a Ferrari? No, I wish I did. <laughs> I know, who doesn't, right? <laughs> it's my, it's your national champion. It's everyone's national champion. <laughs> oh, Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. It's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. People familiar with the matter telling Bloomberg that police in China have detained five current and former employees of the British drug maker AstraZeneca. They are all Chinese citizens being questioned over potential illegal activities. One probe related to the company's collection of patient data. Authorities also looking at the importing of a liver cancer drug that hasn't been approved in the country. AstraZeneca told us that they are aware of the situation but have no further information. Verizon says it will buy Frontier Communications for $38.50 per share. It's a $20 billion deal, a 37% premium from Tuesday's close. Frontier bills itself as the largest pure play fiber internet company in the U.S., so the combo would help Verizon offer high-speed internet more widely. Demand for data usage is only expected to grow, forcing telecom providers to bulk up their offerings. And the 2024 NFL season is upon us. The defending champion Kansas City Chiefs host the Baltimore Ravens in the season premiere tonight. The league then makes its Brazil debut tomorrow, where the Packers and Eagles face off in Sao Paulo. Betting on games this year is predicted to take another leap forward. $35 billion in wages is wagers rather is expected to be made this season. That's your brief, John. Hey, Danny, thank you. More from Danny in 30 minutes' time. I'm next on the program, payrolls just around the corner. If we see a number closer to 100,000 this month, then we'll have to reassess our, our sort of view on the labor market. But our base case is the, the print should come in pretty solid. What if it comes in pretty solid? We'll talk about that next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Stocks unchanged this morning. Good morning to you. Going nowhere on the S&P 500, which is maybe good news if you've been long this market over the last few days. In the bond market, yields higher by a single basis point off the back of a big rally to start the month of September. The 10-year, 376.84. Under surveillance this morning, payrolls just around the corner. Our base case is that a lot of the softness that we saw in the month of July was driven by Hurricane Barrel. And we'll see a 37,000 rebound from the month from the, the state of Texas, in which case our payroll print will be above 150,000, which we kind of view as trend. So if we see a number closer to 100,000 this month, then we'll have to reassess our, our sort of view on the labor market. But our base case is the, the print should come in pretty solid. It's the latest. Traders looking ahead to labor market data for evidence the Fed has achieved a soft landing. ADP employment coming out at 8.15, followed by jobless claims at 8.30, all ahead of the highly anticipated August payrolls report tomorrow. Kathy Boschancic with Nationwide Mutual Insurance making this call. We anticipate the economy created a solid 160,000 net new jobs in August following the softer than expected 114 back in July. This moderate rebound reflects a resilient labor market despite broader economic uncertainties. Kathy joins us now for more. Kathy, you draw a distinction between normalizing and deterioration. Is that a distinction without a difference given the guidance we've had from the Fed chair in the last few weeks? 
Well, good morning, John. No, I think that's exactly what he's talking about. You know, the Fed all along has been aiming to slow down uh, the overall economy and cool the overheating labor market. So if we do get the consensus like forecast and we're right there with with the consensus, if we get that solid increase, uh, then I think they they feel confident that they could you know, they, they've, they're on the way of achieving the result of, of, of a soft landing. Um, and, it, it, you know, there's that normalization. You look at the JOLTS uh, data, the job opening to unemployed workers is now closer to one, right? In, in the middle of 2022, it was two. That was two jobs for every person unemployed. That was an overheated condition. However, uh, as, you know, care for what you wish for, because it's the pace of the deceleration and things could get away from the Fed. And we could see a slower or harder landing in the labor market than, you know, than desired. Kathy, when you look at the underlying growth mix in GDP, when you look at the lack of cyclicality in high rink in the jobs report, where does your confidence come from that we stabilize at these levels? Yeah, so and our confidence is really just for I would say for for this quarter, as we look ahead, we do think that we we see uh, employment growth slow below trend, and we're actually looking for GDP growth to, to slow below 1%. We, we don't, we, that's a soft landing. Um, but it, what you're seeing is those acyclical sectors like healthcare, even he, at leisure and hospitality, um, they remain sturdy. Uh, even education, government, they, they continue to add jobs even when the more cyclical portions of the economy are, are struggling. Uh, but but no doubt, you know, there's an issue, right? The labor market is cooling. And I think the Federal Reserve needs to come to the rescue of the economy, remove the restrictiveness in policy. And then that, I think, helps stabilize things. That's the call for the soft landing. But, you know, there are great risks around that that call. Kathy, what's the downside to going 50 basis points at a time where there's enough signs that this is a restrictive and maybe even very restrictive Fed policy uh, that's uh, potentially going to accelerate any kind of weakness? I, I, mean, I personally would prefer they, they did start a bit quicker and, and go 50 basis points. But I think the risk is that the markets will extrapolate uh, even more aggressive Fed tightening. And, and they're already, you know, pricing in, you know, over 100 basis points of rate cuts for this year, and then 200 basis points over the next uh, for for the for the full year, and by the end of the year, uh, 100 basis points. So uh, I think that's what the Fed is a little tentative about. They don't want the market to go ahead and race further ahead of them. Plus, I think there's some still uncertainty about uh, the inflation. You know, they they're still probably feeling the sting of the Q1 numbers. But I think if you look at the inflation data, especially the three month, you know, annualized rate, there's there is clear reason for them to actually go a, a bit bigger. If the 50 basis point cut, they were con if they were considering that, but they're concerned that that signals really bad news is bad news, and this is a serious deterioration in the economy, what number would we need to see on Friday that could push the Fed, though, to that 50 basis point cut? Yeah, that is it. That's going to be a, a tough decision for Fed officials. Um, I, I would say that something around 100,000 or less moves the needle. And if the unemployment rate uh, ticks up higher, remember last month it, it rose to 4.3 percent. Um, and if it goes even higher, then you're going to start to hear concerns with the SOM rule being triggered even more so. And that means, you know, perhaps a recession. Uh, but then, you know, Fed Chair Powell, I think he's going to have to work hard to make sure he gets a consensus. Of course, the Fed, you know, they, they could cut rates with, with a few dissenters. But I think the first time out of the gate and cutting rates, Chairman Powell would probably like to have, you know, no dissenters and a full consensus there. Kathy, appreciate your view as always. Kathy Bosantic there of Nationwide. Where we have consensus right now, feels like the committee's on board to reduce interest rates on September 18th. The difference between 25 and 50, I'd say it's pretty big right now for some Fed officials. Well, Drew Mattis of MetLife just wrote in, and if he were a Fed official, he would be on, uh, in the camp of, it's a very big difference. He writes, 50 does not equal two times 25. And he said they made the same mistake cutting as they did hiking, waited too long and tried to catch up. Like the hikes, there will be unforeseen problems. And this is what Kathy was talking about with the market. Going a bit further, 
even than the Fed is signalling. Neil Data touched on some of this over at Renmac yesterday. Go 50 when you can, not when you must. Going 25 risks the same market dynamic as Skip in the July meeting. It'll be fine until the next data point makes investors second-guess the decision. Fueling bets the Fed is behind the curve and ultimately pricing even more in again. And potentially creating that weakness that you were talking about to boot. Up next on the program, Dan Greenhouse of Solace Alternative Asset Management, Scott Bessens of Key Square Group, Sean Donovan of Enterprise Community Partners, and we'll speak to Ed Al Husseini of Columbia Threadneedle. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. The recent volatility has showed us how quickly the market can change. It's just going to be a little bit harder if you don't get those mega cap names that are contributing more to the index. We have definitely paired our exposure to stocks overall. The real question is kind of the speed of the deceleration. There's still a lot of opportunities to invest in higher quality assets, regardless of the economic environment. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. It's a big morning for economic data, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The second hour of Bloomberg surveillance starts right now. Your scores look like this in the equity market. They look nothing like we started a week. Equity futures right now just about positive by almost a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq, down by a tenth, but some stability in contrast to the volatility of the last 24 hours or so. The day this morning packed. Starts at 8.15, an ADP report. 15 minutes later, 8.30, initial jobless claims. Then after that, 90 minutes following that, the ISM services report, three pieces of economic data, the appetizer for the big one tomorrow morning. And really key to setting the tone at a time where we've seen those jitters exacerbated by yesterday's jolts data. Here's the issue, and you asked this earlier, John, and I've been thinking about it for the past hour, this question of are we just going to see a repeat of what we saw in early August, we got the July jobs numbers. What I thought was interesting about that moment is how quickly we rebounded. Are we going to see as quick of a rebound, which is essentially what you're seeing in markets that seem otherwise pretty resilient? What we heard from John Solfus, though, right now, what he views all of this is normalization. That's the debate. Are we actually normalizing? Or to uh, what we just heard from uh, uh, Kathy a moment ago, pace of deceleration. If this actually becomes weaker than the Fed was expecting, could it get away from that? Well, let's pick up on the John Stolfus point. He wants cyclicals over defensives at a time when defensives are doing pretty decently, staples, healthcare, and utilities. Yeah, well, he basically believes that if you end up cutting rates pretty aggressively, that will fuel the next leg of the recovery. We've talked about this, the sort of incredible irony on betting on the recovery before we even get the downturn. Here is the rub of this particular economic cycle. We've had this sort of paddling duck or whatever you want to call it, you know, swooning uh, swan. Sure, I mean, we'll go with that. There's this issue of <laughs> essentially you've got different economies that are moving in different, uh, in different uh, speeds. And so how do you sort of bet on ones that are set to revive just because they have been beaten up? Stop looking at me like that. Looking at you like what? Like, I thought um, it was just like the perfect way of framing the price action over the last few days, the swooning swan. Okay. Equities right now on the S&P 500. Keep it together. Look like this. Positive by a tenth of 1% in the bond market. Some big moves in the last day. Yields up by 377 to 377 on a 10-year. Compare that to the two-year at 377. The two-year 10-year is almost perfectly flat right now, Lisa. We did this in early August. Then it unwound. Are we going to do it all over again? It feels like something is different just because the Fed has leaned into the market's expectations for rate cuts. And that is, I think, the most interesting aspect of this. Do we see the long end continue to increase from here in terms of yield price lower? Or do we see even further rate cuts? Right now, we're seeing a low of 2.88% of the cycle for base uh, Fed funds rate. Do we see it go even lower? Hard to see at the same time you're seeing the likes of Howard Marks saying it should be between 3 and 4%. This bond market's a paddling duck. Amazing. Coming up. A swooning spawn, actually. And Greenhouse, <laughs> Solace, saying to look beyond the recent sell-off in equity. Scott Bessens of Key Square Group, as Donald Trump and Kamala Harris put economic policy in focus. And we'll speak to Ed Al Husseini of Columbia Threadneedle, saying the Fed put is back. We begin with our top story. U.S. equities looking to put an end to a two-day losing streak as the data builds ahead of payrolls Friday. Dan Greenhouse of Solace Alternative Asset Management saying this, I'm not too worried. Equities are still near a record high with a terrifically fast recovery from the Japan 
hand sell off. We just have to wait for the jobs report. Dan's with us around a table. Dan, good morning to you. I'm furious. I was not present. What are you furious about? For, for the swooning swan conversation. Well, we can you, have Why it. was I not allowed you want, to? You want to dive in from the top? <laughs> hey. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> We can start with markets. Let's start sure. there. What is this show? What has it become? Let's talk about payrolls tomorrow morning. What's a good number? What's a bad number? And how do you expect this market to respond to it? Yeah, I, listen, I, th this is a fun parlor game to play, but anything north of 140, 150,000 jobs is probably fine. Uh, obviously, the, the goal here is to slow job growth, and that's what's happening. And you see this in a number of different areas. The quits rate has normalized, the labor differential. Uh, the one pushback I would put to the market narrative is the rise in the unemployment rate. And there's this idea that the, call it one base, the 1% one, uh, the 1 increase in the unemployment rate is explained by immigration, by inflows into the job market. And I don't think that's the case. I think to, to, to my eye, it seems pretty clearly that there's job losers uh, and you don't have to be a PhD. The government basically tells you the number of job losers that there are. And that number's up, call it 800,000 or so over the last year. So clearly the labor market's weakening. A number in that mid 100,000 range is perfectly commensurate with what the Fed is trying to do, what the market wants to see. And I think it's probably going to be fine. Let's compare and contrast labor market dynamics with financial conditions. Labor market dynamics are somewhat concerning for many people. Financial conditions, when you look at credit and the amount of supply we've had so far this week, and how well that supply has been taken down. Is there anything to be concerned about at the moment? In general, the credit market's doing okay. You, you brought up credit supply. Uh, year to date, high yield issuance is, is called 30, net issuance is called 30 billion or so. That's flat year over year. IG issuance is doing quite well. Um, there are some inter uh, asset developments, i.e. Some, some loan issuers are shifting back to the, to the fixed income market for, for um, to, to, to shift from floating to fixed, but but generally speaking, you don't really have issue uh, on the on the issuance front, on the on the spread front, which I'm sure you've discussed ad nauseum. Spreads are still pretty well contained, both for high yield and for IG. So there's no signs of stress there. Uh, and even when you go down to the lower rungs of the credit market, where Solo spends a decent amount of time, there's obviously idiosyncratic issues uh, to deal with. But but they are by definition idiosyncratic. There's no uh, economic or, or, or economy wide concern that's that appears to my eye to be festering in the credit markets, likely to spill out into the broader markets. So let's extrapolate that out. I was talking about the Beige Book earlier because I actually found a lot of nuggets in here that were really quite interesting, including from the Chicago region. Existing businesses were seeking financing to cover higher operating costs because the ability to pass price increases onto customers had sailed. How much do you see a potential consequence to lower rates going forward in fueling an unhealthy bout of borrowing that could change the narrative that we're seeing that is really benign right now in credit markets? I think that's probably down the road. Uh, I don't, I don't, right now, with respect to the first point about, about prices, the consumer staple companies, the packaged goods companies, have been telling you this for six months now the Mondelezes of the world, the Pepsis, the General Mills. When you look at their quarterly reports and any staple or, or packaged good, uh, analyst or investor knows this. All of their growth is explained by prices. Sales volumes have been declining quarter after quarter after quarter at infinitum. But on the recent conference calls, all of them have told you that consumers no mas. Uh, so, so we know that. And so the beige book reflecting that isn't too much of a surprise. In terms of the, a, a spate of unwelcome issuance, I mean, sure. But also, let's not pretend that, in, that interest rates are zero again. I mean, we're still at five plus percent. We're on our way, as Howard Marks has said, as a number of people have said, and I would agree, into the threes and the fours, granted over a period of time. I don't know that that spurs some unhealthy or unwanted borrowing binge. Uh, that, that type of stuff happens, uh, I would argue, in, in, in peri far, periods of far more ebullience or, or excitement than I think that we're in right now. There's a question, Dan, uh, about just the longer term, what we're pricing in. The balance of risks for market players that basically agree with the sentiment that you seem to be putting out of there, out here, uh, like a soft landing. Have we overpriced that scenario? The soft landing? Yes. Well, I don't think so. I mean, because right now, listen, these things tend to, there's a reason why no one predicts recessions. Uh, it's very difficult to do. There's a reason why very few people uh, get famous s selling short in front of bear markets. It's very difficult to do. When you look at the data as it presents right now and is likely to unfold over the next, say, six months, where you have some semblance of clarity, let alone further out, this is what's happening. The job market is loosening, but not aggressively so. The Fed's beginning to reduce interest rates. Uh, there are signs in, uh, on, from individual companies that, that things are getting worse, although I, I, I put that in quotes because it's not really particularly bad. So, so for the immediate future and the present, 
things are, and I was suspicious of the Fed's ability to do this. So I say this not as someone who predicted this all along, as everyone seems to have been able to do. Um, from my vantage point, the Fed is getting what it, what it wants for now. And so, no, I don't think you've overpriced it. You're, you're, as an investor, at least from our standpoint, from my standpoint, I'm constantly on the lookout for something that's going to tell me that tomorrow does not look like today. And it's always easy to see in retrospect. So said another way, what am I likely to be upset about tomorrow that I didn't see today? And I don't see that right now. And, and not that I'm the only one who does this, but I try every day to see where I'm wrong, to re-underwrite re -underwrite my views and my ideas, and by extension, Solus's investments. And I just don't see a reason right now to think that there's some imminent threat to the asset landscape. I just don't, I, I, I apologize, I just don't see it. When it comes to the equity market, you think a lot of this is churn in the larger names, but you also talk about the fact that you think politics is involved. Why so? Yeah, so on the first point, I mean, listen, the, the, the spread between the equal weighted and the market cap weighted S&P that we've all discussed ad nauseum is, is, bears, bears attention. Right now, it's the, it appears to me to be a lot of AI related selling, NVIDIA, Vistra, those, those ancillary names. On the politics side of things, I'm not one of these people who thinks that politics dictate, dictates everything that goes on in the market. I've been, we've all been doing this long enough to know that that's not the case. However, I'm also not immune to observing that the day the market peaked in the middle of July is entirely commensurate with the day that Donald Trump's odds of winning the election peaked as well. And, and so I, I believe it was September 15th was, was the date uh, that, that the predicted odds of, of him winning peaked. The stock market peaked on, on July 16th, just a day later. Obviously, we know that Kamala was uh, selected as the, the next, whatever, I apologize. Well, danged, I'm not trying, whatever you want to Whatever, appointed, yeah, sure. anointed, yeah. whatever. I'm not trying to be provocative. I don't yeah. know the, no, the I understand. description. That was July 21st. And, and obviously, the market has struggled since. And I think there are, while I'm, while I'm skeptical that any, any individual political data point moves the market, we are dealing with the expiration of the TCGA. There are spending and, and tax consequences for the market as a whole. I saw a headline coming in here that Goldman put out a report talking about what it means for the S&P if the tax rate goes up or goes down, the corporate tax rate. So there are political implications that, that investors have to wrestle with. And I think based on that observation about, about the peaking in the odds uh, are indeed wrestling with. So let's finish where we should start. Capital allocation decisions. Where do you want to be right now, given everything you've just said in the last eight or so minutes? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Has it been eight minutes? It's, it it's been feels about like minutes. a minute and a half. Um, we're having so much fun. Too much fun. Um, I don't think you can have too much fun. I mean, call me, uh, call me crazy, but I think there's never such a thing as too much fun. I reckon when Lisa started to call this market a swooning swan, I think we're already having too much fun. <laughs> but it also, I think it was downhill from there, because how do you beat swooning swans? Okay, carry Just, on. I'm trying Capital to finish on the call. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, listen, I, I, we still find opportunities in, in, in the market, as everyone does. It, it becomes a relative rather than an absolute game. Uh, I, I, we, we have been long the consumer, for lack of a better word, uh, in the sense that the, the, the idea that the consumer was always on the verge of, of collapsing was not something that made sense to us. There, um, we are a fund that historically has done, done a lot of work in the TMT space, particularly media and telecom, uh, and so we still think there's stuff to do there. But on the energy side of things, uh, obviously you have to pay a little bit of attention to what, what OPEC and the Saudis are saying, but um, listen, I, 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 there's still a lot of stuff to do. Uh, commensurate with what I said earlier about the asset landscape looks okay and is likely to continue doing so. Um, we're still we're still optimistic about asset prices and our ability to perform well. This was great. Appreciate it. Come no, back soon. My pleasure. Thank guys. you. Thank sir. you so much. Dan Greenhouse of Solus Alternative Asset Management. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Volvo Cars is scaling back its outlook through 2026. Rising tariffs hurting some of its models made in China. Just yesterday, the Swedish automaker abandoned its 2030 target to sell EVs only. Sluggish sales have hit a growing roster of car makers, forcing them to walk back EV ambitions. The electric transition, particularly in Europe, has veered off course. Governments have scrapped incentives and a larger customer base hasn't fully materialized. Former Republican Representative Liz Cheney says she is voting for Kamala Harris in November. Cheney says her decision is based on the danger she believes Donald Trump poses. Cheney joins Republicans Adam Kissinger, former Illinois Representative, and Jeff Duncan, former governor, Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, in endorsing Harris. 
Presidential nominees Donald Trump and Kamala Harris have agreed to rules for their first debate on September 10th. According to the host of the debate, ABC, microphones will be live only for the candidate whose turn it is to speak and muted when the time belongs to another candidate. Candidates have two minutes to answer questions, two minutes to rebut, and one minute for follow-ups or clarifications. That debate is in Philly, putting the spotlight on Pennsylvania once again. That's your brief, John. Not even seven days away, not even a week away. Danny, thank you. More from Danny in 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, the tax policy pitch. While we ensure that the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share, we will tax capital gains at a rate that rewards investment in America's innovators, founders, and small businesses. A conversation just around the corner, live from New York this morning. Good morning. As Election Day approaches, Vice President Harris and former President Trump hit the stage for the first time. Oh, we're going to beat her. I look forward to the debate. If you've got something to say, say it to my face. We'll bring you informative analysis. Will that debate decide the outcome of this election? It's going to come down to both policy and performance. Tune in to Bloomberg Television for the ABC News Presidential Debate Simulcast. With special coverage starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. Context changes everything. Live from New York City, welcome back to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about unchanged after a very choppy two days on a benchmark in the United States. In the bond market, yields aggressively lower. A move of 10 basis points at the front end of the curve in yesterday's session. This morning, things a little bit softer, cheaper. Yields higher by a basis point. The 10-year, 376.84. Under surveillance this morning, the tax policy pitch. While we ensure that the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share, we will tax capital gains at a rate that rewards investment in America's innovators, founders, and small businesses. Now compare that to what Donald Trump plans. He plans to give billionaires massive tax cuts and to cut corporate taxes by over a trillion dollars, even as they pull in record profits. We know how to count. So here's the latest. Donald Trump speaking at the Economic Club of New York a little bit later on today, laying out his fiscal policy plans. Those remarks coming after Kamala Harris unveiled a 28 percent capital gains tax on people earning one million dollars or more, peeling away from President Biden's embrace of a 39.6 percent wealth tax. Scott Bessons of Key Square Group joins us around the table for more widely considered to be a potential Treasury Secretary pick. Scott, good morning, sir. Good morning. It's good Thanks to see for you. Thanks me. for coming in. Thank sure. you very much for being with us. Let's start with an easy one. Why do you think that one is a bad idea? Wait, the capital gains tax. The, well, the capital gains tax, look, Kamala Harris is an economic illiterate. Uh, Donald Trump is going to give an extensive speech at the Economic Club of New York today. He's going to take questions. Uh, she's reading from a teleprompter. And, you know, let's, let's just review here. The capital gains tax will be after a proposed tax on unrealized capital gains, which in, in the scheme of the uh, new taxes has to be one of the worst tax ideas in 30 years. Let's talk about how the former president, perhaps future president, might counter that. What are his policies? Well, I, I think you're going to hear from President Trump today. Uh, you're going to uh, hear <clears throat> the, uh, you know, a warning that the Harris-Biden administration caused the great inflation. Uh, Vice President Harris was the tie-breaking vote on both spending bills that led to the inflation, the uh, inappropriately named Inflation Reduction Act and the American Rescue Plan. Uh, they would not have passed without her signatures. I'm still not sure that she knew what she signed, but she did sign it. And, you know, all these policies that she's talking about now, uh, you know, are going to ignite inflation again. Because what happened last time was we got a demand shock from government spending that was met with high levels of regulation, and that's the recipe for inflation. You know, in Trump 1.0, we got a uh, demand shock from the private sector fueled by the tax cuts, and that was met with deregulation, and that's why we had non-inflationary growth. President Trump's going to talk about that again. He's going to talk about 
energy dominance. He's going to talk about not only stopping the inflation rate, but getting prices down, which I, I think is very important for the American household. You know, we're in an affordability crisis, and he's going to uh, address uh, getting the deficit down. I mean, we are at 7% peacetime, non-recessionary deficits. And it is clear now, you know, I, I think I said it last time when I was here, I've been saying it for about two months, that the economy is slowing dramatically. Scott, how do you get the deficit down when, if you look at Trump's policy proposals, floating a corporate tax rate of 15%, campaign is also floating excluding social security payments from taxes, exempting tax on tipped wages, also increasing the child tax credit. All of this is going to add to the deficit, plus tariffs, which some economists will say is inflationary. Well, you know, let, let's unpack that. There, there, uh, you know, there would be income from the tariffs, right? So, you know, th that's a big number. Well, that's o debatable, o though, because some say that's just going to be passed on to consumers. Well, the uh, you know all taxes are passed on to consumers, and I think what's interesting about taxes is. They aren't necessarily inflationary. They're a one-time administrative price adjustment. Historically, 40 to 50 percent of any upward impulse uh, is reflected in the currency. So if the, uh, that would offset it. Then you know, we have the uh, various preferences by consumers. It could end up in foreign manufacturers' margins. Their margins could go down. Uh, so, and you know, their elasticities, consumer behavior can change. But in terms of getting the deficit down, you know, I, I have been talking about it before. I think there, we would freeze uh, domestic programs, except for defense. If you look at the Harris Biden proposals, and she hasn't walked this back yet, maybe she will, um, they're calling for a 21% decrease in defense spending. I can't imagine a worse time to do it. Uh, the only thing that the, uh, I believe, and again, I don't speak for the campaign, but the only thing that I believe that should have uh, real increases is defense. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is the doomsday machine for um, the deficits. It was originally scored at a positive score. It was supposed to be positive 50 billion. Then it went to 300 billion. It's probably going to be a trillion this year, and it's now estimated over the life of this thing that it could be a four and a half trillion hole in the deficit. So hold on a second. Does that mean that you expect Donald Trump to try to unwind it? Put a halt to it. Okay, but not unwind it. Well, I'm not sure what unwind means. You know, I mean, you're, you're not you're not going to level the eight charging stations that we got well, for eight billion dollars. I guess I guess here's the question, and this is the reason why you had the uh, Congressional Budget Office come out saying uh, that Donald Trump's proposals will actually increase the deficit more than Kamala Harris's. We had a story uh, on Bloomberg talking about how uh, potentially Donald Trump's proposal could increase the collective cost as much as two, uh, ten and a half trillion dollars over the next decade. I mean, how do you offset that? Well, for, first of all, and you all know that uh, Bloom, Bloomberg is one of my favorite venues. But I do have to say that that story yesterday in the ten and a half trillion was poorly written, poorly edited, and compared apples to oranges. You know, the ten and a half trillion uh, was everything Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have ever said, and they took it to the highest end. Then they took a score from the Wharton School and said, well, this is the Harris budget or the Biden-Harris budget. Uh, you know, it's apples and oranges. Uh, if we were to take everything that Vice President Harris, you know, including what she said in Raleigh, you know, $25,000 $25, for housing, including for uh, new, new arrivals, uh, you know, that would be substantially in excess. So, but, um, but the Democrats and, and Biden's budget now and Kamala Harris as part of this administration have revenue increases. Where are the revenue increases to offset all of these tax cuts that Trump is talking about? Well, look, I, I think there are pay fors here. Right? So it, it's to cut spending. We do not have, you know, Anne-Marie, we do not have a revenue problem in this country. We have a spending problem. So traditionally, the government revenues, federal government revenues, are 17.5 to 19% of GDP. We're right there now. Since 2000, 
the, we've averaged about a 3% budget deficit. So spending has been you know, 21, 22%. Uh, this administration, led by Vice President Harris, has blown out the spending. We are at a 7% budget deficit right now. And what do we have to show for it? We had job, <clears throat> we had the employment numbers revised down by 800 or 900,000 jobs. We had 250,000 private sector jobs. So the idea here is what we have seen with Harris Biden, you know, it's what's called in Grand Prix driving, two-footed driving. You've got one foot on the accelerator, the Fed is putting one foot on the brake. Scott, forgive me because I've got 10 seconds yeah. left. I don't want to cut you off, so just stick around. Scott Bessens of Key Square Group from New York. This is Bloomberg. Let's get you some price action. Equity futures right now positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we are just about negative. Let's call this unchanged. Things are settling down. Lots of economic data through this morning. 8.15 and ADP report. Initial jobless claims at 8.30. Then later on in the morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time, we'll get the ISM services read. In the bond market, a big rally to start the month of September. The two-year settles down at 3.76, up by about a basis point this morning. The 10-year up by a single basis point too. 3.76.65 and three days of yen strength. Can this continue? Dollar yen looks a little something like this at 143.51. We're negative 0.1%. Typically, we talk to Scott Bess and the Key Square Group a lot about politics, given his potential to be the next Treasury Secretary. Scott, we've also got to talk about what's happening in this market because you've got positions in it. I know that you've been long gold, you've been long the Japanese yen. Are you keeping those positions? I am, and thanks for focusing on my day job. It is, you know, I, I think in the, the Japanese yen, it's an extraordinary opportunity because as central banks around the rest of the world are in an easing cycle, uh, Japan, for the, the first time in almost two decades, is in a hiking cycle. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if they're like cicadas, they only come out once every 17 years, or whether this turns into a, a real hiking cycle. My, my thought is that the, uh, there is the potential for this to keep going. So you want to keep riding this trade. We're at 140 now. We were pushing through 160 previously. What kind of numbers have you got in mind? Well, uh, you know, it's two sides to this. It, J Japan is strengthening. Uh, inflationary impulse is picking up. Uh, you know, the other side is, as, as I've said, uh, you know, the, the U.S., I believe the U.S. economy, you know, I, I said it recently, is buckling. And we're starting to see it in the numbers. I think we're gonna, you know, it's both uh, industrial numbers and labor. And I, I think what's funny here. You know, on the Democratic side of the aisle, and I will put politics back in for a minute, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they've been screaming for a rate cut all year. Yep. Now, you know, even Claudia Somme, who's been chewing off her arms since February for a rate cut, they, uh, doesn't want to come out and say, well, my rule got triggered, and any time my rule gets triggered, we're in a recession. So they don't want to use the R word before November 5th. So the longer Nippon steel waits, the cheaper this deal gets, right? Uh, Potentially for them. Well, yes, exactly. Is they, they, they may have, uh, through you know, some, some terrible timing, uh, get a better price. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Walk me through what you think should happen. And let's finish there. Harris says she wants to block the deal. Biden's given a signal he wants to block the deal. The former president's given us the signal he wants to block the deal. The company has come out to the Wall Street Journal in the last 24 hours and say, if you block the deal, job losses are on the table. We're going to be moving out of Pittsburgh. How do you recalibrate the policy now with that in mind? Well, I, I, I think we've seen, and it, it was very surprising because you know, I, I've been going to Japan since 1989, and Japanese companies traditionally have a, lot, a very high regard for all stakeholders. You know, I, I remember the first time I went and you know, talking about shareholder value, and they said, oh, no, you know, uh, Bess and Son, the, we have our customers, we have our employees, we have our banks, we have our community, and the shareholders are last. And now you know, they've reversed that, they're putting shareholders first. And I was surprised to see a Japanese company that didn't check in with the US stakeholders. They didn't check in with the community. They didn't check in with the unions. They, they didn't check in with the customers. That's the mistake they made, Scott, and this is where we are. Yep. And now we've got to deal with the policy on the campaign trail. Are we going to offer them state aid? How do we keep this company in business in a way that doesn't end up with job losses? Well, look, I, I think that 
the, you know, may, maybe the deal will be resurrected. Uh, Cleveland Cliffs actually forced Nippon Steel's hand with their bid, so you know, maybe a domestic buyer will come back. You don't see space for state aid? Sorry? You don't see space for state aid? Well, I, I don't see why we need it right now. Was, look, we, we did state aid with Intel, and Intel just laid off 15,000 employees. The stock's down 60% this year, and they're probably going to be pushed out of the Dow. They got their own problems. Scott, it's good yeah. to see you. Good it's nice to, to touch on markets too. Yeah. Let's do that again next time. I like Scott Besson's at Key Square Group. We like your day job too. Thank good. you, sir. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, positive by 0.1%. Let's get you some top stories. Under surveillance this morning, President Biden preparing to block Nippon Steel's $14.1 billion takeover of U.S. Steel with a decision expected as soon as this week. This despite U.S. Steel responding that it intends to pursue all possible options under the law to ensure the deal goes through. That stock is bouncing back by 2.4%. As we mentioned a little bit earlier, Donald Trump set to detail his economic agenda in an address today at the Economic Club of New York. The Trump campaign saying the Republican nominee intends to cut wasteful spending and increase energy production to pay for the $10.5 trillion it's pledged in tax cuts. There's a lot of tax cuts on the table. They're going to cost a lot of money. It feels like it's Oprah Winfrey in tax cuts. Everyone across the board seems to be getting some sort of tax advantage. The issue is, is how are they going to pay for it? Scott Besson just there said potentially tariffs. Is that really going to pay for this $10.5 trillion potentially of tax cuts? We also should mention the Biden, uh, the Harris campaign is also talking about some of these tax cuts, but those making under 400000 She is still sticking with some of Biden's ideas of raising revenue at the top. At least we can actually have a debate about this in the next week or so. Trump and Harris agreeing to an agreement over the rules for their first and only scheduled debate set for next Tuesday on ABC. Harris reluctantly accepting that microphones will be turned off during the other candidates' turn to speak. Trump saying Wednesday he plans to allow Harris to speak without interruption. Yeah, by de facto, since the uh, microphones will be off. Look, how much will we actually get and how much will this be? Uh, who has a better vibe? Because we basically have only gotten vibes for the most part since a lot of the proposals that we've heard about are mostly dead in the water depending on the composition of Congress. To me, this will really define whether uh, you have Kamala Harris as the underdog candidate or not, whether you have uh, Donald Trump still very much the uh, preferred winner by a lot of companies, this is going to be a really important seismic moment at a time where people can already start voting. I think that, that point cannot be lost. Yeah, let's talk about one of the issues that's bound to come up next week. Two key data points ahead of the Fed's September decision, kicking off with payrolls tomorrow and CPI next Wednesday. Housing costs remaining a top concern for many, including the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Sean Donovan. Sean is the current president and CEO of Enterprise Community Partners and joins us now. Sean, good morning to you. John, great to be with you. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Let's just talk about the scale of the affordability crisis that you've been talking about for a while and we've been living through. Are we finally coming out on the other side of this? Uh, I don't think so. And in fact, it's getting worse in places. Uh, I've been doing this work a long time, about 30 years. And I think what is different is really two big things. First, it is a problem that is deeper than it's ever been. We have the biggest rent increases we've ever seen. Uh, we have a doubling in what it costs to buy a home in the country in the last few years. But the problem is also everywhere now. It used to be on the coasts. It used to be in our bigger cities. I was in Boise, Idaho last week, and they have a housing crisis there. And so it really is everywhere. It's also driving our economic challenges in a way that I've never seen nationally. Our inflation problem is a housing problem now. You have companies who can't attract workers and it's driving down economic growth. Half of all our renters in the country are paying more than 30% uh, uh, of their income, which is unaffordable. That's $8,000 a year they could be putting toward groceries, consumer demand. And so it really is at a different scale. And it's in our presidential campaign right now, 33 governors across the country, talked about housing affordability in their state of the state address. So it really is a different crisis than I've ever seen. And it, it, it is moderating from COVID, but at a level that is unlike anything we've ever seen. I'll ask a dumb question and you can give me a complex answer. Are we 200 basis points away from solving this crisis with a few rate cuts? Absolutely not, because we are 7 million housing units short of what we need. This, this is a supply problem, not just a rates problem. And uh, that means we've got to take action in many, many different ways, both on demand and on supply. When you listen to the campaign trails, both of these individuals sound 
populist in nature when they talk about the housing market. Kamala Harris saying first-time buyers can get $25,000, a benefit to help them. Don't you think that would exacerbate the problem we are seeing right now? Well, let's be clear. Um, Harris's plan does both. It, it focuses on supply. It, it looks at overregulation. It looks at the need to encourage states and locals, even require them to build more. Um, but we also have to recognize that for a family, that the, the real struggles are for families who can't even put food on the table. We have a record homelessness crisis. And so we do need to figure out how to help people afford housing more. We're never going to bring that cost of housing down enough that most people can afford a decent place to live, right? So, and that that's really, you have to have a balanced program. It also doesn't matter what Trump or Harris say because this will be done in Congress. How could you see potentially a divided Congress get to any resolution on something like housing? Well, this is what's so interesting about the way the politics have changed on housing. I, I said earlier, 33 different governors. I've been in Boise, Idaho, in Montana the last few months. Red states, blue states. Uh, give you another example. We had a tax bill that made it through the House of Representatives overwhelmingly. The, the most bipartisan thing I've been, seen. There was a significant increase in the low-income housing tax credit, the best public-private investment vehicle we have to build more affordable housing in the country. And so I think this really is a moment different from what we've seen in the past where there is bipartisan support around housing. And I think in the tax negotiations next year, you're gonna see uh, a big increase in the low-income housing tax credit. As those policy discussions continue and presumably will take some time, going back to John's point, if the Federal Reserve cuts by 200 basis points in the next 12 months, will that make the home affordability crisis worse or better? Um, it will definitely help. Uh, it will make, uh, obviously, rates are a critical thing, not just for home buyers, but for builders out there. Um, and so that will be important. But I want to go back to the fundamental problem. For many, many years, we've been lagging on building housing. And the supply problem has got to be uh, focused on if we're really going to get to the solution. You talked about how this is a problem that's widespread, and you talked about U.S. cities, but it's widespread globally. And actually, uh, cities across the world are dealing with this affordability crisis, and a lot of people are saying it's because of how low rates got, and because a lot of people could leverage up their home, uh, uh, home purchases, and thus lead to higher prices. Why won't lower rates just do that again? We've already seen home builders building as fast as they have in a very long time during the pandemic, during high rate times. So what's to say that they're gonna keep up? Because we have to recognize that housing is a financial instrument, but you can't build it if you don't allow zoning to, to build that. So in a, in a neighborhood where a community is saying, not in my backyard, uh, I don't want any more housing. Uh, there are different measures of it. Harris's plan says she would add 3 million units. Our numbers are for really af real affordability. We have 7 million units shortage. So rates are just a piece of the issue. But fundamentally, what we allow to be built and, and how we, for the lowest income people, how we support them to do that is critically important. You're an expert in this with a lot of experience, a lot more than anyone around this table, that's for sure. <laughs> Harris is offering two things, wants to incentivize building, but also support buying. And I think we all understand there is a mismatch in the time horizon for those two policies to bear fruit. You can support buying, that works immediately. The supply issue is going to take years to play out. In the near term, don't you risk higher prices with these kind of policies? You have some risk, but, but understand for a family that is uh, right now spending half of their income towards rent or to own something, that increased support might mean they put more food on the table. It might mean that they uh, do other things to support their family. So it has some effect and there is some risk to what you're talking about. But at the end of the day, we know we have to do both. We have to support supply and demand. And I do think what's exciting right now is you have a consensus around the country uh, on Democrat, for Democrats and Republicans that we have to build more. Here in New York, we have a city of yes proposal. In Montana, they just passed legislation that says cities can't restrict housing development uh, in, in certain ways. So that is a, a growing moment. And you're right, it will take time. So we better get started. How long has this problem been building for? Maybe we can finish here and just give you a big picture opportunity. You were part of the government coming out of the financial crisis, the housing crisis 08, 09. 
Were the problems now, were the seeds planted back then, the lack of supply, how connected are these two issues? So what I would say is this has been a chronic problem over decades. Housing affordability has been getting worse for probably 50 years in this country. Um, but it's really become an acute crisis through COVID. COVID gave it a jolt of adrenaline in terms of making the problem worse. Um, I want to go back even before the Obama administration, uh, given that we're on Bloomberg TV. I was Mike Bloomberg's housing commissioner here in New York City. Yep. And this was a huge focus for us, is taking old industrial areas, rezoning them. Right now, we have a billion square feet of empty office space around the country. That's an opportunity to really think about. So absolutely, this is a problem that's been building, but it is different now in terms of what we saw during COVID. People are demanding, those people who used to work in an office, they're now working at home, they're demanding more space at home. And so we have a, we have a demand that's grown uh, enormously during COVID that we have to meet. This was super smart and we look forward to doing it again with you. Thank you, sir. Pleasure Thanks for being be here. here. Appreciate it. Sean Donovan there of Enterprise Community Partners. Let's take the opportunity to get you an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The Nikkei reporting that 7&I, the Japanese owner of 7-Eleven, will send a letter to Kushtar saying that its offer price is insufficient. The Canadian company launched a takeover approach a little over two weeks ago. 7&I is also expected to tell Kushtar to reconsider the price and that concerns remain about competition law. The company did not immediately respond to a request for comment by Bloomberg. Matt Damon and Lin-Manuel Miranda will headline a campaign fundraiser for VP Kamala Harris. An invitation obtained by Bloomberg shows that the dinner takes place in New York on September 18th. Tickets are going for $25,000 a person. Harris's campaign has been leaning on celebrities trying to expand her cash advantage over Donald Trump. An Olympic break dancer, Rachel Gunn, has apologized to the break dancing community. Gunn rose to viral infamy with her performance at the 2024 Paris Olympics, where break dancing made its debut. The Australian lecturer, who goes by Ray Gunn, showcased moves such as a backwards roll, a kangaroo hop, and different contortions of her body on the floor. During an interview on Wednesday, Gunn said she is very sorry for the backlash that the community has experienced due to per her performance. Breakdancing will not be in the 2028 Olympics. That's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. I actually felt like it was very inclusive for the first time I watched breakdancing and felt like I'd re re replicate the moves, didn't you? In fact, my children did replicate the moves right? ad nauseum at home. There you go, shouldn't apologize. Up next on the program, all signs pointing to rate cuts. We've been on the hunt for a while for the Fed to get started with its rate cutting. Rates at the current levels are too restrictive given the slowdown in activity that we have seen this year. Bramo's doing the moves. Is that the move? <laughs> oh, that's one of them. Oh, nice. The nice. kangaroo. Yeah. That won't be up next. From New York, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Equities just turning lower, just a touch. We're down by almost a tenth of 1% on the S&P in the bond market. Yields higher after yesterday's rally. We bounced back a single basis point, 376.84 on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, all signs pointed to rate cuts. We've been on the hunt for a while for the Fed to get started with its rate cutting. We actually think that rates at the current levels are too restrictive given the slowdown in activity that we have seen this year. It's more likely that what we'll see is a 25 basis point cut, but a bit more forward guidance around how they are seeing this evolve and when, what might cause them to actually get more aggressive. So here's the latest. Traders looking ahead to a double dose of labor market data today with ADP payrolls and weekly jobless claims just around the corner. Ed Al Husseini of Columbia Threadneedle writing, the Fed put his back. One of the key unknowns is how the economy will respond to the Fed executing rate cuts. If the pass through of cuts into the real economy is slow, the Fed may find itself behind the curve once again. Ed is with us around the table for more. Ed, good morning and welcome back. Hey, fantastic. You said in your recent note that market pricing marks a broad distribution of outcomes. How wide are the range of outcomes right now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's striking. If you look ahead, uh, you know, we're starting to price well in excess of 100 basis points this year. And if you look into the end of next year, the probability that Fed funds 
manages to stay at around 4% is close to zero. So it's a fantastically broad distribution uh, at the moment and getting broader every week. And there's a feeling it wouldn't take much weak economic data to really amplify some of those bets. That if we drop to 100K tomorrow morning and unemployment stays at 4.3%, we start pricing in a series of 50 basis point cuts. So if you're facing these kind of outcomes and the range is like this wide, you can drive a truck through it. Do you chase this bond market rally? What do you do with this? Um, well, I think we've had a really strong rally so far um, this year. I think what we want to do is take stock that the starting level of yields is still quite attractive, um, that the curve is likely to continue to steepen versus what markets expect. Uh, and so that gives us a little bit of juice. At the same time, I don't think you want to be maxed out. I think you want to leave a little bit of dry powder for an environment in which the data manages to surprise us to the upside. I was struck by the fact uh, that you hear the likes of Howard Marks saying that the neutral rate in this new environment is something like 3 to 4 percent. But if you look at this wide uh, spectrum of potential outcomes, you actually see an average rate below 3 percent by 2026. Do you think that that's maybe overestimating the chance the Fed really does get down to close to zero again? Um, well, I think there's a, there's a really strong probability that that happens in the coming years. Right, that the data deteriorates to the point where unemployment starts to feed on itself. You get those recessionary dynamics. In that environment, the odds that the Fed funds rate goes to zero, I think is exceptionally high. And Fed research does continue to point to that probability being high in the coming decades. Um, will it happen in the course of the next 12 to 24 months is anybody's bet. We have a, s a significant amount of fiscal uncertainty on the flip side of this election that that may forestall a recession. but. If the dynamics are there, Fed funds going back to zero, I think, is very, a very reasonable assumption. There's a pretty profound uh, sort of extrapolation that I'm feeling from you, which is that uh, essentially this is not a different environment than pre-pandemic. That essentially this is not a more inflationary time than we were in 2019 and 2018. And this flies in the face of what a lot of investors are saying, including some pretty big ones. Can you explain why you think so? Yeah, look, I think... Uh, the large part of the inflation story, and again, this goes back all the way to the mid-90s, is, is driven by anchored inflation expectations. We've run this massive experiment in the course of the past three years. The extent to which those inflation expectations form a center of gravity that pulls inflation towards 2%. Um, and I think it's played out really well. It's underscored the Fed's credibility in maintaining that level. I don't see any reason why inflation should be different going forward unless the Fed strategy changes. Inflation at the end of the day is a financial variable determined by the Fed. If the Fed cuts by 50 basis points, then 50 basis points again at a time where the economy is not falling off a cliff, isn't that the variable that could cause a higher inflationary environment? We're going to find out, right? If, in fact, that neutral rate is closer to 4%, that means the economy is going to be very sensitive to rate cuts straight out of the gate, right? 100 basis points of cuts could significantly accelerate growth could put upside pressure on inflation, and then we're not going to get you know, Fed funds below 3 3 3.5% in the coming 24 months. Uh, this is a key unknown. We just don't know at this stage, given how much flux we've had in the course of the past two to three years. I'm pleased that Ed has said all this, because you have to realize how finely balanced things are going into tomorrow morning. We're one bad jobs print away from pricing in a series of 50 basis point cuts, and one good one away from reversing a lot of what we've priced in over the last few weeks. And essentially, what we don't know is what the response of markets will do to the underlying economy. We keep talking about how this isn't a very interest rate sensitive uh, economy, as many people expected, on the way up. What's to say it will be on the way down? Should I fear the disinversion? Can we finish there? When the curve starts to normalize and you get this bull steepener, typically that means bad things are about to or are happening in the U.S. economy. The rate cycle is just about to start or is happening. What is it this time? Could it be different this time? Uh, not as much. I look at the curve and I see in the course of the past, you know, again, 12 to 24 months, the curve was deeply inverted, signaling that the Fed has taken us to a very restrictive place. They're taking the foot off that brake pedal right now and the curve is disinverting. The pass through into the real economy, I think, is, is an open question, right? You had your previous guest uh, talk about the sensitivity of the housing market, the housing capex to those interest rate cuts. It's a key unknown to this day. Um, if, in fact, we see that housing demand come back, housing capex come back, on the flip side of the election, potentially corporate capex reaccelerate, 
the Fed's going to have a really high floor in terms of the cuts relative to what's priced today. Ed Smart, as always, thank you, sir. Ed Ahusani there of Columbia Threadneedle. He's right. We still don't know whether those rate cuts will ultimately unlock a ton of inventory, push out supply, or whether the actual biggest impact will be on demand. We still don't know. Are prices going up or down off the back of these cuts? But that's exactly it, right? We don't know exactly what the circumstances are, what the data is going to actually be, how much has already been priced in, and some of the interest rate sensitive loans that consumers take out, how many more of those could actually get extended by virtue of rates coming down in a way that's not Wall Street focused, that's more Main Street focused and leads more directly to inflation. If you are just joining us, the third hour of Bloomberg surveillance just around the corner. Futures currently just slightly negative on the S&P 500. The third hour looks like this. We'll catch up with Kate Alhillo of Russell Investments. Tim Natanas of Wolf Research, Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo, and Kathy Jones of Charles Swap from New York. This is Bloomberg. We actually think that rates at the current levels are too restrictive given the slowdown in activity that we have seen this year. We're not expecting a collapse, but there is no doubt the consumer is slowing. Not much has changed with the consumer over the last six months. They're employed, wages are growing, but they are being choiceful. The direction of travel is towards a weaker economy. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Growth looks good now, but we do see slowing going forwards. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now. So let's set up the third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance at 8.15 Eastern Time, an ADP jobs report, 8.30, 15 minutes after that, jobless claims. And then after that, 90 minutes later, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, you'll get the ISM services print, three key data points going into the payrolls report tomorrow morning. And Lisa, it begins in 15 minutes. And it really is the key test of how strong is this Fed put? Essentially, how much will people be looking at any bad news data as seriously problematic and any good news data as simply being good, not necessarily abnegating what the Fed is poised to do, which is cut rates quite considerably. So to me, this sort of is uh, what has been behind this broadening out and whether that can continue. I was also struck by what Ed just said just a moment ago. Basically, if the Fed was, if all this pricing in is 100 basis points, right, is there a chance that if the Fed were to actually do that, could that reaccelerate growth and have this concern about inflation? And this is still a debate for some members. Look at what Bostic just said yesterday. The fact that loosening monetary policy prematurely is a dangerous gambit. At the same time, Mary Daly is basically like, we must protect the labor market at all costs. And she's not sure yet whether or not it's 25 or 50, but she's there. To pick up on Ed's point, the market pricing, we often talk about market pricing and how much we're pricing in for September and beyond. Market pricing is the aggregate, the average. We're pricing in whatever. It masks a broad range of distributions. And this is ultimately what he's talking about. Ed's saying that if we get a bad print here, you could be pricing in a series of 50 basis point cuts just like that. You get a good one tomorrow morning. You risk reversing pretty much everything we've been pricing in over the last couple of weeks. That's how finely balanced everything is at a time when the Federal Reserve has said repeatedly they're not data point dependent. He also highlighted that we just don't know the answer to a lot of these very profound questions, such as what is our destination? How inflationary is this economy? How responsive is this economy to rates at a time when people were surprised that it didn't fall off a cliff to how high the Fed uh, raised them? They're all fundamental questions. As he said, we just do not know the answers. And it's the reason why Fed officials aren't really giving us much guidance because they don't know either. They don't have a crystal ball. We don't have one either. So the data drops in about 13 minutes and all of a sudden the ADP is important again. Mike McKee's going to break that down for you in just a moment. Equity futures on the S&P, a little softer. We're down a tenth of 1% in the bond market. Yields a little higher, up a single basis point, 376.27. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Kate Alhillo of Russell Investments as markets await the next batch of labour market data. Tim Natanas of Wolf Research as Nippon's bid for US Steel all but collapses and Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab on why all roads lead to lower yields. We begin with our top story. Stock steady ahead of more labour market data. Claims coming in just under 30 minutes time ahead of August payrolls tomorrow morning. Traders looking for evidence the Fed has stuck the soft landing. Kate Alhillo of Russell Investments saying the inflation problem is largely solved at this stage. Expect we'll hit the 2% inflation target in early 25. The Fed has the space to be aggressive if needed on rates. We still expect a soft landing but we can't rule out the possibility of a recession. Kate joins us around the table. Kate, good morning. 
to you. Great to be here. Thanks for joining us. Let's start with payrolls tomorrow morning and the data through the next hour or so. Yeah. What are you and the team looking for? Well, we're looking for you know, a, a beat on what we saw certainly in July and, and something close to like the 145, 165 range. And if we get something you know, close to that, we think the market is you know, pretty positive, continue to see some of this broadening out. Any chance that we are below 120, below 100, that's where you start to see some you know, material volatility. So good news is good news and bad news is definitely it's really bad news. bad news. Talk to me about where that would leave the bond market tomorrow morning. Yeah, so I think, again, yeah, I don't think the bond market's moving you know, tremendously unless you see the labor market really start to show more signals of a weakening you know, versus a normalization. And then you know, potentially you know, start the recession discussion to be more prominent. We're not there yet. But if you start to see some challenging prints in terms of labor, that's where you start to see some movement. This is really interesting to me. You think it's an asymmetric response, that essentially yes. people are not yeah. going to unwind what we've seen in terms of the rally in the bond market. Yeah. What gives you that conviction? Yeah, well, I'd say a couple things. First, I think the first 100 basis points of cuts, whether it happens this year or it kind of drips into next year, is kind of easy to get to. The 200 or so that's being priced in through the end of next year, you know, that's where you might see you know, some movement you know, still, um, but you still end up having the like, terminal rate. You still have a while to go to get there. So again, I think if you get some good news, the you know, labor market is more normalizing. You know, July was maybe a little bit of a misshoot, but the Fed is still moving to focus on the labor market and not inflation, that you don't end up seeing a big you know, shift back up in rates because we know that the direction is pretty clear. We were talking about the incredible volatility of markets at a time where there are so many unknowns and there just is this feeling yeah. that one data point could really tip the scales in a pretty significant way. Yeah. Do you basically view bad news as being a buying opportunity? I mean, if you end up seeing a negative, some, some really problematic print, can you say, look, you look at the fundamentals, you look at these companies that are performing pretty well, yeah. all right, time to buy. Yeah, I mean, I'd say a couple of things. It's great to actually see volatility back in the market and the market reacting. I think the challenge is it's overreacting to single points or news. And so we're staying pretty close to home in terms of our strategic allocations. So if we see those overreactions, we are leaning into them. It tends to be more as trimming our winners, i.e. even when rates have moved up over the, or moved down over the past period, we've been trimming. If we see a big you know, sell-off, we'll be leaning in. But I think it's more because of the overreaction that we're seeing from the markets because of the volatility and the uncertainty. The market's still trying to find kind of the narrative. When you say trimming uh, in the bond space, and then yeah. we'll go to the stock space, yes. are you basically saying that uh, the market has priced in too many rate cuts? Yeah, so we think that the, the, the magnitude right now is at the point where it's probably as much as it's gonna go unless we start to see a recession themes start to pick up. So we have started to trim some of our duration positioning. You know Connor Sen, Bloomberg Opinion? Yeah. Love Connor Sen. He's great. Check out this tweet. If the Fed was unburdened by what has been, get it? <laughs> Fantastic. And if the Fed had a blank sheet of paper to begin with, they'd probably set Fed funds around 4% instead of where we are right now. Instead of this performative chatter from various people about the signal it would send if they cut by 25 or 50 and the anchoring to 525 to 550, can we play that game? Just some scenario analysis. If we were to have a blank sheet of paper at the Federal Reserve, what would the rate be today? 425, 450? Yeah. So we're about 100 yeah. basis points offside of the Fed. Yes. Yeah, which is why I'd say the first 100 basis points is easy to get to, so you don't see as much you know, movement. It's the stuff further out that we're still trying to figure out in the magnitude of how far they go. We've heard that number a few yeah. times, haven't we? That maybe there are 100 basis points offside. So to Connor's point, what is this performative chatter about, the signaling from 25 yeah. versus 50? If you're offside, get a move on and just say you're offside. Isn't the Fed, and, and this isn't meant as a pejorative, but isn't the Fed essentially a performative instrument? Isn't it sort of the signal that they, uh, that they give to markets? They behave that way, yeah. Well, and so at a certain point, and that really goes to this question of how do you trim positioning, how do you understand whether they're on a trajectory that's much steeper akin to what Ed Al-Husseini was talking about, where they could go back to zero uh, versus between three and four percent? Yeah, and I think that that's where you don't make any kind of severe you know, moves because there is a lot of uncertainty and try to take advantage of the, of the volatility. Kate, this was awesome. Busy 24 hours ahead for you and the team. Thanks for dropping by. Thank you. Thank you. Kate R. Hiller there of Russell Investments. If you are just joining us, welcome. Equity futures a bit softer. We're down by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Just the guidebook, the roadmap for the next 45 minutes or so. In about seven minutes, we get the ADP jobs report. Jobless claims 15 minutes after that. ADP, I had a question earlier this week. I've been leaning on this question a few times. 
I've been asked a few times whether ADP is more important than payrolls this week because of the revisions we had a few weeks ago to payrolls and that maybe, dare I say it, not my words, but perhaps it's a question, not a statement. Perhaps, maybe, let's ask the question, is the ADP more credible <laughs> oh than the gosh. payrolls report how many, this week? Okay, honestly, how can you back away from a statement before you say it more than what you just did? But honestly, that's what we've heard from a lot of people. I've seen a lot of notes saying the same thing, that essentially ADP has been more on par when you take into account the some 880,000 uh, jobs that were removed from the year of uh, job gains through March it's a valid question. Point being, will you see more of a reaction in markets than usual with ADP? Stay tuned in six minutes. <laughs> My McKee's going to break it down. There's your tease. It's a great tease. Put that in a promo. Let's keep an update <laughs> on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Friends, pre French President Emmanuel Macron has picked the country's next prime minister. Michel Barnier is senior conservative figure and the EU's former Brexit negotiator. By choosing Barnier, Macron is opting for someone who largely avoided the bickering of a contentious political environment in France as of late. He faces the immediate challenge of forming a cabinet that can bridge the rifts between the left, right and centrist blocs in parliament. JetBlue shares moving higher in the pre-market trade by nearly 6%. The carrier raised its sales forecast for the current quarter. The results are in part thanks to passengers who rebooked flights that have been canceled by rival airlines when an errant crowd strike update caused an industry outage in July. Third quarter revenue will be between 1% to down 2.5%. Its prior expectation was as much as a 5.5% decline. And Shoe Carnival reporting second quarter earnings, the stock gaining 3.2% after narrowing its forecast but pointing to back to school season momentum. Lisa spoke to the Skechers CFO from the Goldman Sachs Retail Conference. Over the last year, things have settled out, but they haven't in any way pulled back in a, in a meaningful manner. Um, I know that's inconsistent with what you've seen across the broader market, so I think in part that's due to the innovation that we're bringing in our brand to the, to the market. Um, but, but in terms of a major pullback, no, we haven't really seen that yet. Also different than the wider market, Skechers said that it sees long-term opportunity in China. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisa, you were there with the Skechers CEO. Compare and contrast that with what we're seeing elsewhere from companies suffering and struggling in China. Yeah, well, that actually was shocking to me. And they were not alone. On Holding also talking about how they too are seeing opportunity to expand in China. When you talk about tariffs, when you talk about things like that, got to keep an eye on it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But this is a pretty big market, and they talk about how they have local businessmen running their businesses. It just doesn't seem to be moving away from that in a material way. Did you get any sneaker vouchers? <laughs> No, but I did They're ask giving him, away sketches at I, a conference. I did ask uh, the Skechers CFO how you make Skechers cool. And what, what was the response? He also has teenage kids. And he asked he the same questions, yeah. And they asked the same questions, and then he started talking about the factories and innovation. Okay, you can tell us what you really said in a moment. No, right? really, that's it. Okay, all right. Up next, the Morning Calls Plus, Tim Natanas of Wolf Research, as Nippon Steel goes after U.S. Steel, and they hit a major roadblock in Washington, D.C. All of that and an ADP report just around a corner from New York. This is Bloomberg. The economic data begins in just a few seconds. We get an ADP report, then after that we get jobless claims, then it's the big one tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern time. The payrolls report, we are looking for a number of 165, the median estimate in our survey. Your scores going into this data, negative on the S&P by almost a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, softer by a third, adding to the losses of the last couple of days, kicking off September in the wrong way, that's for sure, for the equity market bulls. Switch up the board and turn the page and we'll turn to the bond market as we get a downside surprise on the ADP report. Yields are dropping to 373 on a two-year. Mike McKee 
the wrong kind of downside surprise on this number. The wrong kind of downside surprise, unless you are betting that the Fed is going to be cutting 50 basis points because you've got 99,000 jobs, according to ADP, created in the private sector during the month of August. That is far lower than the 145 anticipated. Remember, we got 145,000 total jobs, 114,000 total jobs in August from the government, and the expectation has been that that would jump up, but it has not jumped up, at least not in the ADP numbers. Now, ADP has revised down their July numbers to 111,000 from 122,000. So definitely a disappointing number. And given the fact that we have seen markets react to much less uh, jobs data, lesser jobs data this week, I would imagine this is going to scare some folks. So equity futures just a little bit soft. They're not too much drier, actually, Mike. We're looking at futures down by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yields were a bit higher early this morning. Now they're lower. If you switch at the board and go to the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year, we can just take a sneak peek of things to the front end of the curve. We're down a basis point or two now to 373.73. In foreign exchange, dollar yen around 143.13. But Mike, there are some people out there wondering whether ADP is about a signal of where this economy is at compared to payrolls, which got revised so heavily a few weeks back. Well, remember that ADP is revised a lot, too. We just don't pay attention to it. I just mentioned uh, they dropped their numbers to 111,000 after the government report came in at 114,000. So it's probably not uh, valid to say that ADP is more accurate. Plus the fact we're all talking about this 818,000. That'll get revised again. This happens every year. Uh, bigger magnitude, and when you get uh, turning points in the economy, you see bigger magnitudes of changes like this. So um, it's not a surprise to statisticians and economists, but I can see why Wall Street is a little concerned about it. Uh, interesting thing in the uh, ADP report, they're still saying manufacturing losing jobs, 8,000 jobs. They have been saying that for months, and it doesn't happen. So we'll see if that happens this time. Um, professional and business services, somebody's, uh, something that uh, economists have been watching closely, down 16,000 in their survey. So uh, these would sort of portend problems if, uh, if we get the same numbers in the, uh, in the payrolls numbers. Can you help us with just the framing of this? Because we, we throw around these numbers, 99,000. We're expecting uh, tomorrow somewhere between 120 and 180,000 jobs uh, added. This question of what it means to be good or what it means not. What is the appropriate <laughs> number of jobs being created? And should it be actually significantly higher now than, say, 10 years ago or six years ago, given how much bigger the economy is? Well, we you make a valid point about the size of the economy. We've gone back and forth about what the level of job creation needed to absorb new entrants to the labor force is. The Fed's looked at somewhere around 100,000 or above, but that's not a number that Wall Street's going to find acceptable. And it becomes a matter of not what the level is, but the speed at which it has decelerated. That would scare the Fed. Uh, if we got 100,000 this week, the Fed would say, you know, that's not a terrible report on a, uh, a statistical basis, but because it happened so fast that we fell off, yeah. that that suggests the economy is slowing faster than we thought and we need to do more. I, I don't know how many market participants would come out and say that's not a bad report based on a statistical basis if we got 100K tomorrow morning. <laughs> well, if you put a bunch of economists in a room, they would tell you that because they're... No, you know, I have no doubt we, economists we, would say we're, that. We're nerdy actually, people who... <laughs> hold on a second. And I just have to respond to that. There are some people who say that it actually should be closer to 300,000 of jobs created. And that actually, it was normal what we saw before, just based on how much bigger the economy is. So we don't have a sense of what's tight and what's not. I think that's compelling. If you go into a room of economists, you just walk out confused. Mike, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to help. 99,000 is the number on ADP. The estimate was 145. Equities negative by 0 0.2. We're down 0.5 on the Nasdaq 100. I talked about that bid into the bond market. The two years down by three basis points now. The dollar is weaker. The yen's much stronger now. 143. We're on the brink of breaking that level. We are negative on that currency pair by 0.5%. Time now for some morning calls. First up, BMO Capital Markets downgrading Dollar Tree to market perform. The analysts saying the discount retailer's disappointing second quarter earnings report was the final straw. Was reading that note this morning, pointing out competitive issues. Not issues around the consumer, 
competitive issues, execution problems. Their stock is down by another 1.7%. Next up, Barclays upgrading Nordstrom to equal weight. The analyst citing a proposed $3.8 billion deal by the Nordstrom family to take the department store chain private. Their stock is up 1%. And finally, Wells Fargo upgrading Roku to equal weight. The analyst seeing potential in the company's Roku channel service and strong revenue growth ahead. We're positive there by a little more than 3%. Turning to US Steel, Timna Tanners of Wolf Research maintaining her outperform rating on the name. Back in August, Timna saying the best odds for a Nippon takeover approval were under a possible Harris administration, adding that Japanese ownership is the best option for the steel union as the company will likely shutter if the deal falls through. Timna's with us around the table for more. Good morning. Good Thanks morning. for being with us. You wrote that ahead of the news in the last 24 hours. How have things changed for you? How has your base case shifted? Look, there's no denying that if uh, President Biden were to scuttle the deal, it's, it's a done deal, right? That, that's hard to, to, hard to combat. <clears throat> it's very unusual. And so it it's, wasn't really in our base case. But at the same time, first of all, it's not done until it's not over till it's over. I do think that this could be very aggressive negotiating tactics from the union, unprecedented perhaps. Uh, and I think that the alternative to the union is likely losing jobs. So I really don't understand the the outcome here being, uh, being staying with U.S. Steel. Are we like saying without suicide. a takeover, this might not be a viable business? No, I'm not saying. I'm just saying that there are some assets that are union owned that would be shuttered if this deal goes, uh, doesn't go through. They have other assets that they prefer that they've invested in and uh, ignored the union a bit, which is part of their beef with them. But they would shut union jobs, I think, very clearly be in the next several years if the deal doesn't go through. You think there's a case uh, to own U.S. Steel even if this deal doesn't go through. Can you explain why? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, so much focus on the deal has gotten a different kind of investor in this space. But if you look at fundamentals and you say, even on our pretty challenged steel price outlook, and you look at the peers where they're trading at and give U.S. Steel a discount on our numbers, stocks 35 to 45. That's what we've been saying in our notes. And they're starting up new capacity that will allow them to actually outperform peers in terms of volume. So that sets them up, I think, a little bit differently. And then assuming they execute, which I think they will, Again, it's really tough to see a lot of downside. How do you make sense of just the timing logic of Nippon uh, coming out with this deal at a time that was clearly politically fraught? You know, I don't think it was really clear. It was a year ago when they started this process that U.S. Steel did. And I think clearly the participants underestimated the politicization of this. I mean, if, if you look at the steel industry, I was thinking about this, it's 5% owned by Russians. You know, there's quite a bit of uh, foreign capacity over the years, and U.S. Steel did a very public process that was endorsed by all their, you know, per, you know um, their, their board, et cetera. So I think everybody just underestimated how much this would get politicized, given that many of the states they operate in are, you know, states that are toss up in the election. But why didn't they do more to get the union on board? And I'm not in the weeds on that, but I mean, I feel like they did a lot. I mean, Nippon came out earlier this week and said that they would commit to a sizable investment that U.S. Steel standalone certainly would not. So you, Nippon would keep those assets running, the, the union assets. I thought that was a pretty big statement. And the union, I feel like their protests have gotten milder and milder every time I see one of their missives. So I did think we were moving in the direction of perhaps getting it closer to, to finalization. So we'll see. But I, I think they tried and maybe there was a cultural barrier. We've talked so much about U.S. Steel and not enough about Nippon Steel. What does Nippon ultimately want in an asset? And if they don't get this one, where else are they looking? Well, they'll be blocked from the U.S., right? That, that's for sure. I mean, Nippon is, is a, Japan is a melting ice cube in terms of manufacturing capacity, right? And they've been losing blast furnaces over the year, principally because China is oversupplying the market. But they've also been losing their automotive business has all uh, migrated, if you will, to the U.S. So they're just following their automotive customers. So that seemed like a natural transition. But again, I don't know this national security argument, is, I guess, in the way. Can I pin you down on a base case now? Have you got one? Does this go through after the election? Uh, I, I mean, after if it goes through, it goes through after the election. Right. Um, it, the, fifty fifty still. I, I went above fifty fifty. I guess it, it seems like below fifty fifty. That's all I'm going to say for now. Timna, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's a tough one. Timna Tanner's of Wolf Research. How they're campaigning is one thing. How they govern might be another. And I think a lot of people wondering why Nippon Steel didn't just wait until after the U.S. election. Although, as Timna said, and I think it's a really important point, they started this process a year ago. That's how long this stuff takes. And they didn't maybe consider the fact that it's a swing state. But what foreign country, what company is coming into uh, this country and saying, 
Is it a swing state? I guess it's, they should. Isn't that what you pay people for? I guess so. Yeah, they should have. It's right? purple. What are you thinking? Yeah, exactly. OK. <laughs> if you're just joining us, welcome to the programme. We'll get some jobless claims for you in about five minutes' time. We had the ADP report a little bit earlier this morning, about 10 minutes ago, in fact. It came in with a downside surprise. ADP lower than expected. Equity futures off the back of it. Bit of a delayed reaction here, but we've got one now. We're down a third of 1% on the S&P, down by 0 0.7 on the Nasdaq. Just to check out the bond market, down by three or four basis points at the front end of the curve, 372. We've got tens at about 373. So we've actually got a positive sloping yield curve, two year out to 10 year of a basis point or two this morning. Just to put this into perspective, two year yields back at the lowest that we've seen going back to September of 2022 as people price in the, persp uh, the, the possibility of a bigger rate cut. ADP takes a while for people to realize they really do have to care about it. And that's what you're seeing right now in markets. It's usually shaped by whether markets care and then other people follow. Exactly. You know, like, does ADP really matter? Today it does. The anxiety around the economic data in America continues to build. Jobless claims just around the corner. Let's see if they continue to put a lid on some of that anxiety. That number drops in just a moment. Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo joins us alongside Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. Both here to react. From New York, this is Bloomberg. So one down, two to go. ADP, downside surprise, jobless claims coming out in just a moment. Then it's the ISM services later this morning. We came in at 99K on the ADP report, 145, the median estimate off the back of that. Futures a bit softer, down a quarter of 1% on the S&P. In the bond market, the rally continues after a pretty strong start to the month of September. Yields now down at the front end of the curve by four basis points at 371. To help set the tone for today, jobless claims. And Mike McKee, this is the right kind of downside surprise. <laughs> this is the right kind of downside surprise. Jobless claims fall 227,000 after 232,000, a revision upward of 1,000 uh, last week. This is for the last week of August. Continuing claims at 1,838,000 uh, after 1,860,000. So that falls as well. So uh, <laughs> overall, the jobless claims numbers are pretty good. I'm looking at the unadjusted data and they went down jobless claims totaled 189,389 in the uh, unadjusted data which is a decrease of 3300 so we are not seeing layoffs and this gets back uh, to yesterday the beige book where you saw over and over again in the beige book that uh, fed districts were reporting companies saying they were holding on to workers but they're not filling jobs via attrition and they're not uh, fill, fill, filling jobs to expand. They're just kind of sitting with what they've got. And uh, it looks like that's definitely the case here between ADP and jobs claims. Not letting people go, but they're not adding people either. This market really just feels like it's so finely balanced right now on a knife's edge. That number just dropped and futures briefly turned positive on the S&P 500. And if you bring up the bond market at the front end of the curve, yields were a little bit higher going into ADP. ADP came out, downside surprise, bonds start to rally, yields drop by up to four basis points. This number drops, yields start to unwind some of that move. We're down now only two, two basis points, the 373. And this is why about 30 minutes ago, we opened up this hour and we all said, this is how finely balanced things are going into payrolls. We are one bad print away from pricing in a string of 50 basis point rate cuts and one good print away from seemingly unwinding some of the moves over the last month or so. And the lack of clarity in the economy is really uh, just sort of uh, unprecedented in many ways. I keep thinking about this and Mike, I'd love your take on this. I keep thinking about what the difference is and how big the delta is between not hiring a lot of people and actually firing people. And it seems like even in the beige book, people aren't hiring people as so readily unless they're going to try to replace a role. How connected is that as a step to then laying people off in this sort of not linear trajectory, but very predictable trajectory? Well, it's definitely... Uh a semi-predictable trajectory in the past in terms of when you go into recession. First thing you do is you cut back on workers' hours. So we'll be looking at that tomorrow to see if uh, hours work go cuts back at all. Uh, you cut back on temporary workers, and we saw that in the ADP report today with uh, professional and business services falling by 16,000 jobs. So those are signs that things could be happening. But everything has been so weird since the pandemic, which we keep saying and saying, and saying, you've got people here wondering, 
are we normalizing because we had such a strong labor market or are we going down and the Fed needs to take emergency steps to stop it? Throw in two other factors. One, it's September. And so the markets are primed for bad news. And every September, the market goes down and, and we're seeing that they're looking for things to get upset about. And then you have the election. And there are people who are saying we're waiting to see what happens with the election before we make any business spending plans. So with all that together, you can imagine sitting around the table at the Fed and trying to balance all that out it's and tough. deciding what you're going to do. Mike, we've said on this show, though, for months now, we've asked the, the following question. Are we seeing a welcome calling or an unwelcome deterioration? And after Chairman Powell's speech, at least in the near term, I do wonder whether that's a distinction without a difference for them, because he has now come out and said, we don't welcome any calling at all from here. So if you get any further signs of calling, and arguably we're still seeing it, it's just setting them up for action, isn't it? Well, it's going to be very interesting tomorrow because we have John Williams, who's vice chairman of the Open Market Committee, and we have Chris Waller, who's sort of the intellectual center of the economists on the uh, Board of Governors, who are both speaking. We'll get their views after uh, the jobs number comes out. Actually, uh, Williams is speaking as the jobs number comes out, so I hope the folks at the Council on Foreign Relations have their Bloomberg on their phone, uh, you know, on right one of those in front. Them when in front it's of happening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, to ask him about it. But they it's their last chance to send a signal because the blackout starts on uh, Saturday. So if they are worried and they don't want the markets to overreact one way or another, uh, they'll hopefully tell us. You nailed it. We've all got it circled. Governor Waller, 11 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking of John Williams with two speeches, one of them with big in red, Good jobs report. Yeah, yeah of course. One. Bad jobs report. <laughs> Two edits. <laughs> Two edits. And it basically is looking at the Bloomberg. It's like, okay, all right, which one? And that's essentially maybe how we're going to get message. You just get a marker pen and start scribbling out methodical and gradual. Just take out those two words, right? <laughs> Seriously. Mike McKee, thank you. Appreciate it. If you've missed the last 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, we had the wrong kind of downside surprise on ADP, 99 versus an estimate of 145K. We had the right kind of downside surprise on jobless claims. Jobless claims came in at 227. The median estimate was 230. I said earlier, if you walked into a room of economists, you'd walk back out confused. If you look at this data this morning, <laughs> you're not getting clear direction either. Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo is challenged with solving some of these issues. Jay, what is going on in the labor market in America? Well, John, I mean, I think you, you, you kind of talked about it before. I mean, you know, what we're seeing is we're just not getting as much hiring um, as we had before. And I think that's consistent with the ADP number we got this morning. But we're also not, not seeing businesses laying people off. And that's consistent with, with the initial jobless claims number. So, you know, the labor market is moving, has moved back into better balance, which is a good thing. Things are slowing down at the labor market. But, you know, you, you and I think Lisa used this word uh, earlier, you know, you, you're kind of on a knife edge right now. And, you know, you don't want things to deteriorate further from here. Jay, what gives you confidence it won't? Is there any reason to be confident that things stabilize, that this isn't just a moment in time, it's an end state for the rest of this year? So I, so I think there's two things, John, that th things kind of stabilize here. And, and, you know, recession is not the base case call. One would be, if you look at the financial position of households, in general, it's pretty good. Yes, we have seen uh, delinquencies go up on credit cards and on autos. Um, we've seen, you know, we're hearing antidotes of low-income uh, consumers feeling some stress. But if you step back and you look at the, the debt situation, if you look at the debt service ratio of the business of uh, consumers, it all remains pretty good. And the same thing with applies to the business sector in general. Businesses in, in writ large don't really have to lay people off um, you know, in, in aggregate right now. And so those, I think, are two good things to let's take a deep breath. Things aren't falling apart out there. And you know, a continued expansion is probably still the base case. Jay, let's say uh, the base rate right now is 100 basis points lower, and companies uh, had a, an easier time borrowing at a more a reasonable price. I guess, would you start to see a pickup in hiring based on the fact that companies are still hopeful and are frankly the reason why they haven't been more aggressively hiring is in part because of uncertainty around the economy as well as the election? 
You know, at least I think that's part of it. But, you know, we're also seeing, when you look at the, the overall economy, you are seeing signs of, of softness, right? We all know that, you know, the housing market has been kind of soft for a while. We all know that manufacturing has also, is also soft um, right now. The only real thing that's really holding up the economy right now is the service sector. And, and so, you know, when we get the ISM number at 10 o'clock, that will be important to, to tell us what's, what's going on in, in there. Um, and so, you know, as, as, as rates come down, uh, um, the the, you know, the point here is that should help to stimulate uh, sort of things. I think there's some uncertainty, whether it's, elect, whether it's um, towards the election, whether it's towards the economic outlook in general. But, uh, you know, in general, what we are seeing is monetary policy is in a restrictive stance right now. Rates do need to come down to help stimulate spending. Jay, is this normal to have this level of uncertainty? The knife's edge that John was talking about, this idea that things could tip the scales one way or another. Is this always how it feels at tipping points that seem to last forever with such model data? Yeah, you know, when it, so uh, there's always uncertainty out there, right? And if you go back, you look at the pandemic, right? That was a very fast moving sort of situation. You look at the financial crisis, lots of uncertainty around there. Absent a major shock, um, and the, you know, the last major shock was the pandemic a few years ago and the unwinding from that. Absent a major shock, I'm kind of hard pressed to think of a time in the last you know, few business cycles when things have felt a little bit uncertain as they do right now. So I do think it's, it's, it's not normal um, right now, given where we are. Uh, but we're, you know, unfortunately, just the nature of the way the economy works and, and the way the overall geopolitical situation works, there's always a base level of uncertainty. You said earlier, not much hiring, not much firing. Sounds very Goldilocks. But we heard from Mike McKee was just talking about hours worked will be important. What kind of number of hours worked would you need to see to then get concerned that potentially the next point of call is going to be layoffs? Yeah, so if we're seeing, you know, if we're seeing aggregate hours work tomorrow going down, let's call it 0.3% or something like that, then I'm starting to get a little bit concerned, um, you know, at, at that point. And so I think Mike had a really good point there in terms of the hours worked. And, you know, what, the first things that you do see is you see uh, te temporary workers start to go down. You know, um, I, it's like 24 out of the last 26 months, we've seen the number of temporary workers going down. So we're already seeing that. And if we do start to see hours worked going down, down by that, that magnitude, 0.3%, 0.4%, then I'm really starting to get a little bit concerned. Jay, thanks for the update, sir. Jay Bryson there of Wells Fargo. The team over at Wells Fargo looking for a half-decent jobs report. What is a half-decent jobs report? Tomorrow, something in and around 150 is basically what we're hearing. Bank of America looking for a punchy 200K. City at the other end looking for 125. Bank of America looking for a 25 basis point cut in September. City looking for 50. There's a spread in the estimates for jobs there of about 75. And Lisa, that's about the size of the average reduction in the revision over the last 12 months. So um, the difference between 25 and 50 is about the size of the average revision over the previous year. And it's also the difference between views that call for a soft landing, Bank of America, or a potentially a more likely recession, which is Andrew Hollenhorst over at Citigroup. It highlights how uh, disparate people's opinions are, not just of the headline number, but how you read that through to an economy that's still hanging in there and whether that actually does kind of undermine this idea that everyone's betting on a soft landing. The two-year right now is not betting on that. It's betting on something worse potentially, at least in terms of the price action of the last three days. We're not even three full trading sessions into September stateside, and we've had a move of almost 20 basis points lower on a two-year. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab joins us now for more. Kathy, why do you believe, and welcome to the program, why do you believe that all roads lead to lower yields from here? Well, I think the fundamentals just tell us that, John. Uh, we've had the weakness already in parts of the economy, manufacturing in particular, but also evidence of some slowdown in consumer spending. Uh, but also you have the whole global picture right now. So you've got weakness in China translating into some weakness and softness in, in Europe, particularly in Germany in the manufacturing sector collapsing commodity prices um, and that's really been notable in the last couple of weeks it's been notable for a while but really seeing those industrial materials prices come down and then you get to the u.s where policy is restrictive um, the fed has already sort of pre-indicated that they're going to cut rates um, what's going to send rates higher from here would be the question i would have all roads seem to point to 
Fed easing, lower rates, and more disinversion of the yield curve. Then if you extrapolate that out, Kathy, how much lower can they go if you really do see this as a more inflationary moment than pre-pandemic? Yeah, you know, I think the um, the terminal rate, nobody really knows where that is. Right? Everybody's guessing. And that estimate's going to move around based on whether we hit a recession or whether we yeah, are, are able to pull off a soft landing. But we'd say Fed funds rate at 3% um, is kind of a base case scenario for us. It doesn't give you as much room as you go out the curve for yields to fall in the Treasury market. But there's still a substantial distance between five and a half percent and three or three and a quarter percent in the Fed funds rate, which is is where we think we're going. We've been talking a lot about how credit markets have been very behaved and they've been working in tandem, frankly, with stock markets in terms of continuing to gain, even though there are these concerns about a weakening labor market. At what point, at what data uh, levels would you start to get concerned about credit quality at a time when perhaps there are a number of people talking about this being a little bit more pernicious than just a soft landing? Yeah, I think we've been fairly cautious about credit, probably too cautious in this cycle about credit, wanting to stay up in credit quality because of the concern that we'll see some spread widening and spreads have been so low. We are seeing some widening, say in high yield, you know, triple C's are greatly underperforming other parts of the high yield markets. You're seeing a little bit of dispersion there. In the investment grade market, um, I guess I would be concerned if we had a, a real solid recession indicator that came out, um, you know, negative employment growth, that kind of thing. But this is, we've talked about this, Lisa, many times, this is a different cycle when it comes to credit. Um, borrowers have, have been able to refinance their debt if they need to. Uh, there's been plenty of money available to do that and push out, term out the, uh, the debt over a longer time period. So we're not looking for a big blowout in spreads, but we do favor staying up in credit quality. Hey, Kathy, I just want to finish with the yield curve slowly normalizing. And as it normalizes, whether it's easier now to convince people to get out of cash, when you speak to the charge swap clients, what are they doing? They have been moving out. You know, we've been on this uh, bandwagon for quite some time, fortunately. So those who um, have taken the leap, I think, are feeling pretty good about it. We're not um, favoring long duration at this stage of the game. I think it's kind of missed enough of the move at the long end to suggest that's not a great idea, unless you're in a laddered strategy where you're just spreading out your maturities over time. But we still think there's opportunity and, and money to be made in, uh, in the bond markets as yields come down. Down. But uh, yeah, a lot of clients have already kind of moved out the curve and taken that uh, that advice. They're finally listening. Kathy, thank you. Appreciate the update. Kathy Jones there, Charles 12, going into payrolls tomorrow morning. Before we talk more about the jobs data and a week ahead, let's give you an update on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Verizon says it will buy Frontier Communications for $38.50 per share. It's a $20 billion deal with a 37% premium to Tuesday's close. Frontier bills itself as the largest pure play fiber internet company in the U.S. So that combination would help Verizon offer high-speed internet more widely. Demand for data usage is only expected to grow, which has been forcing telecom providers to bulk up their offerings. And the Wall Street Journal reporting that Donald Trump plans to adopt Elon Musk's proposal for a government efficiency commission. The journal cited portions it viewed of Trump's speech that he plans to give to the Economic Club of New York today. Trump will reportedly outline a suite of economic proposals, taking a more aggressive swipe at regulations and pledging to rescind certain unspent funds appropriated during the Biden administration. The journal reported that he will also double down on his embrace of crypto, removal of hurdles for new drilling and broad tariffs. And taking place later today at our headquarters in New York City, Bloomberg Power Players, where we gather industry leaders, investors, and athletes revolutionizing the business of sports. You can catch conversations with names like Cal Ripken Jr., women's soccer commissioner Jessica Berman, Steph Curry, and a live taping of the deal with Jason Kelly and A-Rod. Tune into Live Go on the Bloomberg Terminal, or you can stream it on Bloomberg.com. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Thanks for this morning. Up next on the program, setting you up for the rest of the week, looking ahead to payrolls and looking ahead to earnings from Broadcom. We'll catch up with Mark Lipotsis of Evercore ISI.
Equities on the S&P 500 just a little bit softer as we count you down to the opening bell, about 40 minutes away. Here's the trading diary in the calendar for the rest of this week. ISM services coming at 10 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Fed speak from Williams and Waller. It's going to be big, particularly Waller at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And then it's the main event as well, payrolls tomorrow morning. As traders await more jobs data, Broadcom reporting after the closing bow today. Mark Lipatsis of Evercore ASI joining us now for more. Staying bullish on the chip maker as it ramps up AI revenue streams. Mark, thank you very much for being with us, sir. I just want to talk about some of the pain more broadly in the chip sector over the last few weeks. What do you think is behind that? And are you willing to lean into some of it? Yeah, so normally what happens uh, in, during a semiconductor upcycle uh, is uh, typically every cycle over the last 15 years, you see a mid-cycle correction. And typically this happens when the industry revenues kind of hit a year-on-year -year revenue growth peak. So you continue to have revenue growth, but it is at a decelerating rate. And that, and because in, uh, semis are a momentum group, uh, what you see is typically a lot of momentum investors use that year-on-year -year peak to get out of the group. Um, so, but um, historically, if you look at what happens after a mid-cycle correction, the group bottoms, it bounces, we kind of have a period of volatility, which is where we are right now. And then the group typically outperforms on average by about 20% over the next six months. So there's still growth um, and uh, we like the group here. And uh, generally speaking, we want to be buying the group. Buying the group, uh, what about specific players that have performed in a disproportionate way? And I'm thinking of NVIDIA at a time where maybe some of the other players can play catch up. But NVIDIA is now facing, you know, too big monopolistic types of accusations, accusations as well as sort of a lack of proof cases in terms of uh, how it's being used. Well, you know, what's interesting is if you if you look back in time, you know, we always viewed uh, uh, computing as being the big uh, driver of consumption of semiconductors. And over the last 60, 70, 80 years, what you notice is that there's a new computing era every 15 to 20 years. So these computing eras typically last 15 to 20 years. And in the beginning of every computing era, the, the use cases are often um, questionable and they're, they're hard to imagine, uh, like the PC in the 80s uh, before word processing and spreadsheets came out, you know, like cell phones, you know, when the iPhone came out in 2007, we didn't really understand that we were going to have YouTube and Waze and Uber and Lyft and all these uh, really worthwhile applications. So uh, we think it's actually um, normal uh, for, uh, you know, the initial use cases to not be as exciting. But if you look at what happened this earnings season, you have some of, you know, the most important companies of the world talking about how AI is generating a return. Amazon talked about how AI saved them 4,500 developer years of work. Google said that AI generated billions of revenues for them. Walmart said, you know, they generated, you know, 850 million pieces of data for their catalog. And without, you know, with the, the, they were able to do that with 100 times less people. So we think the use cases and the return is there. It just hasn't kind of come through to the consumer. So if a consumer uses ChatGPT, they say, hey, we can use that to write a poem. Is that useful? But the big companies who are spending the money are finding return. Mark, we're talking about this at a time of real economic uncertainty, and that's really where I want to go with you. How independent is the semiconductor cycle from the economic cycle? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the thing about the semiconductor cycle is that semis are in the beginning of the supply chain and uh, the consumers are all the way at the end. In between, there's distributors, contract manufacturers, OEMs, OEM distributors. And historically, what you've seen is when semiconductor lead times increase, everybody builds inventories and semi revenues go up 30, 40 percent. And then when their lead times shrink, which is what had happened over the last year or so, um, everybody shrinks their uh, revenue, uh, their inventories. And so the semiconductor revenues uh, show negative growth, right? So we believe we're at the bottom of an inventory correction and um, and actually we're in about an up cycle. So in, in small, you know, more nominal um, uh, economic times where, you know, maybe the, the GDP is only minus one or something like that, you see the semiconductor cycle actually trumping the, um, the economic cycle. Now, if you have a great recession and GDP is minus 8%, then, that's a, then, then, then the semis can't work. Uh, but we think we're at the bottom of inventory correction and that the uh, restocking cycle will, will start to take over. Mark, we're also in an election cycle, and this is an industry that is very sensitive to geopolitical concerns and political concerns. Dan Ives yesterday saying there's political agita when you look at a name like NVIDIA. 
Who's better for this sector, Trump or Harris? Well, I think that, um, you know, what we what we have observed is that, um, you know, the the geopolitical uh, uh, policies seem to be quite similar between the administrations. And this is one area when you think about like the, the CHIPS Act, for example, where you have bipartisan support. So we think that um, it doesn't really matter uh, which policy, which uh, administration uh, gets into office? Uh, we think that you know there may be nuances in second or third order impacts, but by and large, we think that you know the industry has the support of both administrations, and um, so we're we're positive about the uh, the industry. Mark, a clinic. Thank you, sir, for coming on. We've got to do this again soon. Mark Lepotz is there of Evercore ISI. Tomorrow is going to be a single-issue programme. It's the Payrolls Report, and here's the lineup: Jay Pulaski of TPW, Priya Misra of JP Morgan, Mike Collins of PGM Fixed Income, Torsten Slock of Apollo. The guesses. Can we call them the guesses? I think we can. The estimate, the median estimate in our survey, 165K, the previous number, 114. Looking for the unemployment rate to drop back to 4.2 from 4.3. The number tomorrow morning, we'll see you then. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.